Welcome back to another episode of the Big Ass Cornhole Podcast. Sean and Dane are with you again. That we is. That we is. What's going on, man? Not too much, man. Got a had a nice, fun weekend of watching cornhole. Nice. Do you have a nice Valentine's Day? I had a lovely Valentine's Day. Made a little surf and turf. I was gonna say you, uh, you had quite. You were a chef boy RD over here. Yeah, I, I, I definitely uh, did some lobster tail, a little parsnip puree, some filet mignon, some green beans. You know, got after it. Treated the wife. It's yeah. good. And you're Special straight. day. And you're straight. That's Bought, good. <laughs> Bought myself a good. couple weeks. All right, Dane, let the folks know what we're sipping on at home in a segment we call What You Drinking? <laughs> what You Drinking? Sean, we're bringing it back to Cleveland and back to beer. Come on now. Irish Setter Red from our buddies at Thirsty Dog Brewing. So good. Dude, they make every beer they come out with is a banger. Um, this one's like six, five point four percent. Very drinkable, oh. lovely, delicious red ale. Crushable, yeah, crushable indeed. They sell it in a twelve pack for a reason. <laughs> so, um, thank you to Thirsty Dog Brewing Company and Irish Setter Red. Get yourself some. And this brew review is brought to you by our friends at localbagcompany.com. Have you not tried Pro Blend resin yet? I feel like a broken record, people. Jesus, buy some, try it. Go to localbagcompany.com and grab yourself a set. Well, Cornhole Peeps, we have another excellent episode planned for you all today. We're going to be recapping the action from this past weekend's ACL National event, touching on a few topics that came to light. We have bags to review. Up today are three series of the newest Ultra Bags, Psycho X, Widow X, and Viper B. Oh, yeah. And then we're going to be joined by ACL Pro and runner-up in singles at the first national event, Doug Zaft. And the owner of uh, Ultra Cornhole, Mark Pryor. Ooh. But <laughs> oh. but before we jump into all that, Whoa. we'll bring you what's going on in our cornhole lives <laughs> in a segment we call In and Around the Hole. Are you too good for your home? Answer me! Brought to you by Airwolf Athletics. Do you want to look sexy? Start at the top and work your way down. I'm rocking the lid today. Little luck of the Irish for you. Um, go to airwolfathletics.com. Use code BIGASP. Get yourself 10% off. And at this point in your life, if you haven't added a set of the sexiest bags around, you're doing something wrong. That's right, folks. Blackjack Cornhole. You get free shipping, amazing customer service. It's a no-brainer. So stop what you're doing and go grab your gear from blackjackcornhole.com. You can save 10% if you use code BIGASP. Yeah, boy. Did you have a league last week? Did. We did. Um... And you've kind of found, you guys a... have found like a new bag, right? Like you're Yeah, kind of we actually, uh, we, we went with the Viper Bees here and, uh, we both liked the speed. We both threw it pretty damn well. Uh, we just, dude, we, it was not translating to wins, which was, uh, that's frustrating. Yeah. But you know, me and Tom both felt like we threw pretty, pretty decent all night. I mean, it wasn't, uh, wasn't like the previous nights, that's for sure. So, uh, we'll find it. We're coming to form at the right time and I'm looking forward to this week. Next week, I'm going to have to skip out, but I'll still be playing cornhole. We will. So, uh, yeah, next week we go to Kansas City oh, for the yeah. Open. We decided we're going to play the blind draw, and we are going to play open doubles. Just, we're there. Why not play? Let's we'll get play content along the way. Yeah, yeah. why not? Um, so I've been trying to, at work on Wednesday and Thursday, figure out what bags we're going to throw. Um, I think we kind of decided we're going to at least bring four sets. Um, I think we decided definitely on Viper B, because you're a big fan of that right now. Mm-hmm. We're going to bring the WTF Delta, which is a faster carpet type bag um but just kind of fits both in our wheelhouse um and then i have to decide what i want to bring so <laughs> i haven't decided yet probably viper c and then one other one i haven't decided yet yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to go for hole friendliness over yeah. blockability yes you know let's pour some bags in the hole call it a day let's get to tier one let's go i listen i'm going there with zero expectations <laughs> i don't care i just want to go play as many games as i can i think uh if you follow the amount of beers we consume there's like a cap to see what tier we'll end up at. Probably four. I think the most beers we have, the higher tier we'll, we'll end up in. Oh yeah. Mm, now scratch that. More beers, we'll get we'll get up into tier one. And Throw Thursday, I strategically planned our flights to give us like a a two hour layover, <clears throat> just enough time to go in, you know. Refuel, if you will, mm-hmm. stop at a bar before we get on our next flight. Dude, but I, is there anything better than an airport bar? I mean, I, I love an airport bar, dude. I'll, oh, just, I'll sit there better. crush We're, I'm going to be like a kid on Christmas, Thursday morning. I'm going to drop off my kids at daycare, <laughs> and then 
I'm assuming Bloody Marys before we leave. Uh, yes, 100%. Uh, obviously. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be a fun trip. If you're going to Kansas City, hit us up. Let me know uh, where Blind Draws are. We're gonna be there Thursday night, so we would definitely want to try to find something Thursday. I mean, then Friday and Saturday we're gonna be busy with the open stuff, but Thursday night we're ready and available. I wanna we're roast meet the people. Us. Let's get out on the town. All right, all right. So this past weekend, let's move on to the recap. The first national event of 2022 happened. Um, so let's start with singles, I guess. I Obviously, mean, there was a there was a monkey removed off of someone's back. There was Matt Guy finally gets <laughs> over the hump, if you want to call it that. He wins his uh, first hump? singles event at a national uh, since he's been an ACL pro. It was just a matter of time. Um, I mean, if you were a betting man going into it, he was obviously the easy bet. The guy was throwing, I mean, he literally was throwing amazing all weekend. Um, just kind of handled business, especially in the finals the day before. I mean, weren't that many really, really close matches. I mean, Mark Richards gave him a little bit of run in the semifinals, but, um, overall, I mean, he's just, just down the middle man and just nine and no, what can you say? I mean, prove was... that you don't need a block to win. Um, yep. you could just, I mean, all he's doing is shooting and sliding. I mean, that's all it is. So. But no not fear. everyone has his airmail. No. I mean, that. <laughs> no, not even close. So. You right. know what? I, I loved it. Like, it, it showed that he's in good health. Oh, absolutely. And then, so he ends up in the finals on the broadcast. He plays Doug Zaft. Doug Zaft out of Arizona, throwing Vipers, ultra-sponsored player, going to be a guest here later on in the show. Um, he was super impressive um, in the, the night before when he had it. I mm-hmm. mean, just on fire. He plays such a high lofted bag but be, he throws vipers but he still plays kind of like that dirty game a little bit oh, yeah because he gets such a high loft that, that bag does not scoot forward and he is an underrated much. if you really watch him play he uses a bully bag very very well so he throws that slick bag and he carries it so deep that's exactly he it, just yeah. kind of pushes other bags just and he nickels and dimes you to death like he's okay with getting ones and twos and he's just gonna do it over and over and over again the unfortunate part is when you meet Matt, if when you play like somebody like Matt Guy, he's not going to give you that many opportunities. Yeah, I mean you couldn't you couldn't miss. I mean he he capitalized on a couple of those opportunities, but I mean at the end of the day he missed too many. And my favorite part of the match was when he finally got on the board, and you yeah. could just see like that look on his face. He's <laughs> like, finally. Um, but yeah, I mean I super impressed. I mean I don't think that's going to be the last time we see Zaft with his style of game. He's always going to be in the mix. It seems like. And last year in doubles, he had a lot of success. It's nice to see him kind of take that step forward in singles now, what? kind of propel himself. Let forward. me ask you a question about Shoot. that finals, uh, the final match. Yep. Why? Why wasn't the crowd like on the side of Matt Guy at all? I think it's just easier to cheer for an underdog. I think everyone likes an underdog. That's why. And I get it. I mean, we're from Cleveland, so we're always we're the forever underdog. Yeah, yeah. I like, think I, honestly, I think that's what it is. I don't know. Like, I'm just. I appreciate what Matt Guy put together this weekend, and to me, like, I, I expected him to win this. The you know why? It's like, so like, I think it's almost like the Tom Brady effect. Like when Tom Brady, if you were to, if he would have won another Super Bowl this year, sweet. You yeah, I mean? guess, but like, like, this is also his first singles win. Like, it is, but it's like you almost expect him to win, so that like, there's no surprise element. If Zaft wins, he upsets Matt Guy takes second once again. It's a bigger talking point. Matt Guy wins. All right. Well, we kind of expected he was a favorite going favorite going in. Um, I, I, I don't think he's disliked. I think again, I think it's more just, just people like the underdog. And you're right. Any court you go to watch him, whoever he's playing, the crowd's pulling for whoever whoever he's playing. Regardless. That's true. Yeah. It's just I, I just found it weird that like you you could hear a pin drop when when Matt Guy was scoring. But he is. I think he's that type of personality, though. He feeds off that. Oh, yeah, he does not. Be, I, exactly. Mac guy does not give two shits about what people think about no. him. But, like, I don't I just. I almost think it helps him stay focused. Yeah, I just, I respect what he did this weekend. And, like, I don't know if I was there. I would, I root both ways in, in a oh, match yeah. like that. But I like, just want to see a good match. Exactly, I don't really yeah, care yeah, who I mean, wins. But I'm still just as impressed when Mac guy goes up and rips airmail after airmail like it's nothing. Absolutely. Um, and then my s- second question I have for you. Was Matt Guy's victory to the detriment of the Cincinnati Bengals? Ooh, um, did no. he take that little no, bit I think of juju we, that they needed to pull it, bring it home? No, I think we. I mean, I think the officials had a little bit. Yeah, of I don't think. That. The, I don't um, think the Bengals had enough money to pay the officials off. Um, but anyways, uh, obviously, yes. Okay, all right. If we're, uh, yeah, I can hear all the <laughs> LA fans now be like, "Oh, the the missed face Matt call." Yeah, I get it. Whatever. I'll give you one as a makeup call. Yeah. 
There's right. a time and a place the, for the, in call. air quotes the pass interference call that they made. All right, I'll give you that one. But then the second one, come yeah. on, man, you can't. I mean, five free plays. Come on, man. Come on, man. Let's do it. All right, Dylan Turpin and Mark Richards were the other bracket winners. Unfortunately for them, um, they didn't get to play on ESPN. I think that I at least Dylan posted on Facebook that he had a he thought after he won his bracket he thought he was done for the night he thought hey I made the broadcast like you know celebrating a little bit yeah. taking you know just taking that breath like fuck yes I made it well then he had to go play Doug Zaft it was a good match um, he just said he wasn't fully mentally prepared but I tell you what don't Turpin throwing heat man throwing some gas man throwing now I'd be interested to ask him because the first time he played Tanner Halper. He threw deltas. Mm-hmm. The second time he played them, I believe he was throwing the Bravo. I don't know why he switched because the boards actually seemed pretty slow. I don't know if it was just strategy, if that's just what he was feeling at the time. But um, both bags obviously worked. Um, he just unfortunately ran into Zaft, who was just red hot at the time. Mark Richards gave Mac Guy a run for his money. That dude, I, I we're gonna see him on a broadcast this year. Um, whether it's in doubles with his partner Lopez Jr. Mm-hmm. Or in singles, um, the dude's super impressive. I let's just, I guess, while we're here, let's get on that topic. How bad does it suck that you win your bracket and you don't get a shot on ESPN? Dude, I mean, I was disappointed for them. Honestly, I wanted to, I wanted to see all those matchups too. Uh, to me, those are pressure cooker matches that, like Dylan said, he did not expect to play that last one. I don't know, like, if it was how much they let the players know beforehand. I guess so, like, I mean, I, but I always want to see those singles matches more so than, like, the Super Bowl or something. No, I, I agree. So, um, what I wanted to do, let me pull this up. Somebody actually sent me a message from Trey. Where the hell is it? Taylor. Taylor Stone, owner of WTF. Obviously, he was really excited. Um, you know, his, his team made it to... The, he won a bracket, right? So Dylan Turpin's a WTF uh, Cornell sponsored player. That's a that's huge. That's why I'm rocking the jersey. That's too. a huge. Listen, man, that's that's a big time. We saw it with kill shots firsthand. You get your bags on ESPN, and you, all of a sudden, if your team wins, it could blow the fucking market up. Yeah. So it's a huge opportunity. We'll get that to that in a second. But to explain why the other bracket uh, winners didn't get to play. Trey said um, it was the same as last year for the first three events. No pro singles semifinals were played on ESPN last year, except for the final chase when they had a second broadcast slot. So when they only have one broadcast slot, they only play the singles finals and then they show the double semifinals. And then I think it's if they have time, if all those matches go relatively quickly, that's when women's kind of fills that gap. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, honestly, I get it because that's Trey from Trey. a little bit more exciting to watch. And when I, when I posted on Facebook about like how bad it sucked for the bracket, I wasn't trying to bash the ACL. I was just simply saying like, it would suck that you win your bracket, you do all that hard work. You think you're going to get there. And then you just, you just don't like, you got to win one more game. And like, at that point it's even harder. Yeah. It would still be nice if they would like, did they, did they play that match on the broadcast stage or anything? No. Well, so they were broadcasted after the Super Bowl. It was on the ACL Digital Network. Yeah. So I think it was on, I think it was on Facebook, but I watched on their app where it was listed as like bracket A part two, bracket B part two, and that's where you can watch the semifinal matches. So if you're looking to fi- go watch those matches, I know for a fact they're on. They're a- like ACL their app. Network. Yeah. So okay. I know for sure they're on there, uh, and both matches were really good. See, um, to me though, like that's. That's still making a broadcast, in my opinion. And I wasn't I wasn't rooting against Zaft. I wasn't rooting against Guy. But what I wanted to see was I thought it would be cool to see two new bag companies make it on the main stage. Mark Richards throws Gladiator bags. Yeah. And then you obviously have Dylan Turpin. He was throwing WTF bags. I thought it would have been a cool opportunity for just another exposure for two different well, you know, bag companies. And, and, and worthy, worthy companies to be on there too. I yeah. mean, they're, they're good bags. They make and good listen, bags. People want to joke. And I, I mean, when we were doing this contest, some people made some comments about like gladiator bags and that they suck. Obviously they don't suck. I mean, Mark Richards can fucking throw. I mean, I, he seems like the kind of guy you could probably throw anything, but he's, he chooses to throw those bags and they're obviously fucking working. Cause he had Matt guy on the ropes all the way up to the end. Yeah. I mean, are they unique? Sure. But, you know how many unique bags we we find and like. I mean, they're they're one of those companies that take a little bit more risk than some of these other ones, and they put out a good product, man. It's, but again, it, Dylan it Turpin not be for everyone, but it's he's a good a, he made the run that I thought he could. I didn't know if he was going to make it all the way in my bracket write up. I had him winning a subsection. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he did that. 
Um, I didn't have him obviously advancing that far. I thought he was going to kind of get stopped by, I think I had him losing to Halper, but obviously, um, Halper ended up winning. Well, actually, no, I had him losing to Windsor. Cause I think Windsor was in that same little, uh, that same side of the bracket. But anyways, I mean, Dylan Turpin hats off to you. If you can beat Tanner Halber twice. Boom. I mean, that's, that's big time right there. Absolutely. I agree. hundred percent. Do you need another? Oh uh, yeah, please. There you go. Thank you. So, um, let's see who else. I just want to kind of go through real quickly some of the other guys Here, where I they can, finished. I can pop this up too. So, um, so we had second in their bracket. We obviously have Tanner Halbert. We had Jordan Power, Duncan Clemmer, and Alex Rawls. So pretty much, if you're looking at the top eight guys, pretty familiar names. If you if you're like a cornhole fan, all right. So pretty familiar names. Third in the bracket, you have Philip Lopez Jr. Mark uh, Mark. Richard's partner in doubles. You have Alex Hicks. You had Tyler Parent and Josh Holland. Um, any one of those guys, how they were throwing that day, could have easily won their bracket. I think Alex Hicks was really affected by that two-hour wait. So if you weren't paying attention to what happened, they actually stopped all the singles matches when the Super Bowl was going to start. They made the announcement, and then after the Super Bowl was finished, they went back and resumed. Alex Hicks, I just I think that layoff really hurt him a little bit, got him I out mean, of his it's rhythm. Easy. It's probably past his bedtime. I mean, the kid's 12 years old. Shit, it would have been past my bedtime. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it just messed it up a little bit. Um, tell you what, I tell I'll give all the credit in the world to Duncan Clemmer. I posted a clip this past week. Um, Clemmer versus Tyler Parent. That match was super entertaining. If you haven't seen it, go find it. Um, I guess while we're on it, let's talk about that subject. The no yeah. step rule, right? Tyler Parent. Now I've been, a, we've had him on the show. Really crazy. Good guy. Very unique throw. I have never seen him throw like that before. I had seen him throw where he steps over the line, I mean, he was but he keeps, full extra, but he like... keeps his foot in the box. Like similar to like a Frank Modlin type thing. Yeah. This was, he was stepping over line and then falling with his other foot and oftentimes crossing the midline. To me, that's where the biggest, the bigger fault was crossing the midline. I posted the rules uh, from straight from the ACL website of the whole line crossing thing. And people, to me, it's just, it's too black. It, it's just too gray. It's not black and white enough on the rules because it says basically upon release one foot has to be has to remain in the box. So I thought, okay, that you can still step over the line, release it, but your your back foot has to stay in the box. Yeah. Which it wasn't doing. But people were arguing, no, that's only at the release. Your follow through, you can do whatever you want. That's where they really need to get nitty gritty and break the shit down next season. I agree. Obviously I don't think you can make a rule change mid season. But in the off season, I think the ACL needs to get a panel of players of cornhole experts, whatever you want to call them, get them in a room and really hash this thing out. Because eventually, if you want it to be like an Olympic type sport, you need to have these hard, steadfast rules. Like you can't be having this black and white. Like there has to be some sort, if the line is there, the line is there. And people were joking, you know, saying Tyler needs to hit the weight room. If he can't throw the bag 27 feet, ha ha, we get it. All right. You're not funny, but could he step back to the back of the board and do a same throw and probably be okay? Yeah, probably. Does he do it to get inside people's head? Tyler said, no, he said he never does it to be intentional. What I would say, and I, and again, this is not a shot Tyler. I would say, go back and look at the clip that I posted when Tyler steps over and he crosses midline, Duncan Clemmer is about to take the bag and throw it. And he stops and he's like, you know, basically like, what the fuck Tyler steps back. And if you really look closely at Tyler, he smirks. You smirk in that situation because you know you're in their head. Yeah. Hey, and... and the worst part is Tyler Parent is well-spoken. He's a hell of a player, and he's a good dude. And he's making himself into some sort of like this cornhole enemy for people that don't know him because he has such a unique throw style. Do you think it's time to eliminate this and make that line the line? Like, you cannot, it's a foul line. You cannot cross it until your bag comes to a complete stop. See, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Okay. I agree that you need, I think there always has to be one foot left in the box. Yes. I would agree with that. If you want to step over as you release, as long as one foot stays in the box, because that's going to help prevent you from crossing the midline. Yeah. And I know they changed the rule where you have three seconds to get back after your bag comes to a stop. And, you know, again, there's that argument, like 
does it when your back comes to a complete stop if it goes into the hole as soon as it goes in the hole technically isn't that the bag is stopped so you have three seconds to get back mm-hmm. so we had somebody from the acl actually reach out on our post and they clarified saying that he went up to tyler you can say his name i mean i th- okay or not that's fine yeah thank you i was i couldn't remember exactly i couldn't remember which one it was but he basically he took his time came out and said he actually spoke to Tyler before doubles saying, Hey, I went back, reviewed some film. And I saw that sometimes you were like three and a half, four seconds before you came back. It it might've been Keck. I just, I couldn't remember exactly what it was. There was Josh Keck posted it on the fucking posted like 140 comments. So like, I couldn't remember Mm -hmm. exactly what it was, but he said that he let him know the next day. If I were Duncan Clemmer, he and has every right to call him out. On thank it. you. Just so, call him out. And I know some people were like, they shouldn't be on the players to police themselves. Listen, have you never played like rec basketball? Like, you know, pick up basketball, you, you police yourself. Yeah. If somebody is doing something, Duncan Clemmer, I don't care what the score was, should have stopped that moment right there, called for an official. I agree. Yeah. And at the one point, he even pointed to his clock because Tyler Parent was way, I, it was hard because he had called a timeout and then he came back and he took a long time. I didn't have a timer. I didn't see when the timeout was called and all that stuff. But regardless, if he thought there was an issue, he should have called over a rules official and had him watch. I mean, but to me, like, if you don't call Tyler Parent out on it, is he really in the wrong? No. So, like, to me, like, he's only, he's doing that metal game. Like, what, to me, if you're not going to call him out on it and he's getting away with it. How is it? And you're still thinking about it, then you already lost and he's winning. Yeah, because, I mean, is there really, I mean, if you want to get down to it, is there a difference between that and, like, someone talking shit? Like, let's say, like, a Cody Henderson sort yeah, of chirping exactly. a little bit. Yeah, it's, to me, it's the no? exact same thing. He's, it's he's just a different little... version of a mental exactly. game. Exactly, yeah, it's a silent And guess what? Game. If he broke a rule and you don't call him out and you don't call an official, it never happened. Did he, I mean, how many how many games did the Patriots play with deflated balls until they got called out on it? Well, that I don't know. Exactly, the world will never know, all right? But that's what I'm saying. So I, the people that were saying that it shouldn't be up to the player to call over an official, I just, I completely disagree. There does not need to be an official at every single court that because 99% of the players stay behind the line. There, there's typically not any controversy in the game. We're talking about a very small percentage of, of situations where, where that would happen. And then some people were like, well, maybe there should be an official just on the broadcast court. Again, it doesn't matter. There's such a small, I mean, we're talking about one match here in, and I'm sure it happened a lot and other people were upset about it. I know when Tyler Perrin played Chucky Love, I'm going to be interested in talking to Chucky Love next time I see him, asking him what his thoughts were about it. But again, Chucky Chucky will tell it like it is. Well, again, and I'm not, this is not like a bash Tyler pose. (laughs) I just think it's a, it's a conversation that's going, it's going to happen. I I think that I I will Tyler for doing it, honestly. And I will, I will not be surprised by next year, before the season starts, they completely eliminate that rule. I agree. Like, there's no, there's no reason that you have to take that extra step forward. Now, I understand, like, you know, a lot of guys take that like airmail toss. They they mm-hmm. use that little step, like Trey Birchfield does, and he like kind of steps forward a little bit, like on his tippy toes as yeah. he's watching it. That's okay in my mind, but it's, when it's, it's your like last de- bag. Yeah. It's yeah, different yeah, when yeah. it's like deliberate and you're like following through and then like circling. That's, that was kind of what was doing it to me yeah, was yeah. the circling back. Well, I believe if I, it, and correct me if I'm wrong last year in the ACO, like their big money event where Tanner Halper was playing. I think, I think it was Caleb hurt. If I'm wrong, correct me. But I, I think Tanner got called on a foot fault and it was one of those situations where it was his last bag he threw it and he just kind of followed through, just like just walking. kind of followed, kept walking. And they called him on a football because technically his bag didn't stop and he had crossed over the line and they called him. He lost the bag, gave up points. And I know from that point on it fired him up and then he basically played perfect. He ended up winning the whole thing, but they called it. He broke the rules. I just, I feel like next time, this time next year where I, I have a strong feeling that they're going to change, they're going to change the rule at some point. But you, you bring that you bring that situation to light when I watch guys playing singles. I mean, their fourth bag, every single one is just walking after they throw it. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to have to stop doing that. I I don't know. That's what I'm saying. But if they're not going to stop it, then I think that they just need to get clear on the rules. There's too much room for interpretation in the rules. Eliminate the rule, the rule, uh, the room for interpretation and make it very black and white. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. I think the rule, like, it's getting to the point now where if they really want to be 
taken seriously and take that next step into being like possibly an Olympic sport, you have to make the rules ironclad. Like there cannot be rules for room for interpretation there. So is there, is there a way to, to deem it from not being a foul line as opposed to a three point line? If you get what, if you catch my drift, I would even know. Cause like three point line, you can jump over and still a three yeah. pointer. As long as you release it behind the line, foul line, you can't cross it all. Well, basically that's what the rule is right now. Yeah, it's three point line rule. That's how I see it. Yeah, it's like I mean, you can I... have both feet go across. So like, that's that's the point with with the whole um, parent thing. Is like that's not what we're calling illegal. It's to me, it's just the midline and the time it, he's, he's taking to get back in the box. How I listen again, it's it's all interpretation. How I read the rules was that I have thought that the, the your back foot had to stay in the box because upon release of the bag, one foot has to still remain in the box. Now. I get that it doesn't say anything about follow through. That's where I'm getting at. It needs to then take that next step further and then talk about follow through. Just one foot need to remain in the box the entire time. And it's actually kind of genius because I believe that the caveat is they wanted the players to be able to step out of the box completely when the other person was throwing. Okay. Like, I don't know if that was like a COVID tweak that they made that you could step out, but I, I think that's where they have, they have to change it. Like if you're throwing, one foot has to remain in the box the entire time. Because it's a big difference, I think. I I mean, yeah, it is. And watching... And it, listen, somebody else brought it up. If, you, if you've if you watched Alex Hicks play a few times now, right? Yeah. He's... Every once in a while, he steps on the board. Yeah. When I mean, that's... Like that's, that's, that's over it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... And his foot... I've seen his foot go on the board. That is... Uh, I mean, that should that should be a dead bag if someone called it. Yeah, but it they, could be a dead they bag. never do. They won't. That's what I'm saying. So, if you're not going to call it, then you can't bitch about it. If if Duncan Clemmer really had a big issue with it, if if it was really bothering him, there is no problem with him calling over a rules official. And someone brought up, um, well, he doesn't want to get ridiculed like Matt Sorrell's for calling. No, listen, the whole Matt Sorrell's and Jamie Graham potty gate or poop gate, whatever you want to call it last year, potty was the gate. fact that poop gate. it basically <laughs> it basically looked like Sorrell's was trying to duck playing Jamie Graham. He wanted to buy. Yeah. That's where it was. He called a time before the guy ever got there. Not that he called a rule because he thought Jamie Graham was breaking a rule. Yeah, he was. That's 100% correct. It's different. Yeah. It, it is different. It's different. The optics are completely different. If Duncan Clemmer would have been like, you know, hold on, call over a rules official, explain to him what's happening, and then someone's there the rest of the time, completely respect it. Yeah. And 100%. like, I mean, we're not obviously. Clemmer ended up winning that match. So, yep. like, we didn't. We There was no. Nothing really came of it afterwards. So, mm-hmm. at the end of the day. Tyler Parent's going to keep throwing that way yeah. until somebody calls it on him. And he should. And if, if it's not technically by the rules. Yeah, it's not illegal. But what I've been told by a thousand people, if it's not illegal, then everyone needs to yeah, quit just bitching shut, about shut it. Mouth. And then if somebody calls in a rules official on him, if it's really bothering him that bad, then let's see how the rule is interpreted. So when somebody talked about bringing in an official on every court, they're like, well, it, maybe it could be like golf. And, you know, like in golf, people like uh, that are watching on TV can call in. And report rules. Can you imagine the ACL <laughs> getting fucking Trey Ryder's Jesus. phone just blowing the fuck up? Yeah, because exactly. people he's trying to broadcast. People are like, "Hey, on court forty-seven, uh, so and so touched the bag before it stopped moving," or I think his toes are over the line. Can you go check that? Like, I I just think that would be hilarious. It would be so funny. You got to go back through all that footage and things. Stuff. To, to things to think about. about ACL. Things hey, to think about. You could you could have a million posts on one match. So overall, um, I did the little write up on hard drag push for singles. I got 50, I think I got 50% right. So not bad. I was, I was happy with it. So I always pick the bracket winners. Yeah. Who I think is going to go. Um, I picked the Josh Holland and Matt guy one correctly. Um, I think I, I can't remember who else I had out of there. Um, I think I had Mark Richards making the finals. Um, I had power doing, uh, reaching the final. So overall I thought it did well. The prediction It's so fucking hard right now. It is so hard with how deep this thing is. And certain players um, make a run that you wouldn't have really expected before this all. Um, Nick Williams, for example. Yeah. Nick Williams had a fantastic start to his uh, his rookie season. You have PDC players like Jackson Gord getting fourth in his bracket. Mm-hmm. And can we just say, were we the first ones to talk about them? Like what a what if, like they got in there. Oh yeah, I know a lot like, of people are, have been is, saying that, man. but like we've we've been saying this for a long time that if they got their opportunity to make it, they're going to make a splash. I, I mean, he Jackson made a hell of a run, took fourth in his bracket, and then in doubles, 
I want to say they tied. I want to say maybe. I find Let's see where they're at. They had a nice run. Here we go. Tied for 13th. Yeah, tied for third. I mean, that's pretty freaking solid. Yeah, absolutely. For two non prof I mean, well, technically they're pros, but PDC players going through. PDC, um, right now it's looking like not that bad of a gig. Yeah, not at all. No, I mean, you, you can get they took, I think, a total of to go in and... five. Yeah. I think they took five people, got an opportunity to go play in the pro event. That's pretty awesome, man. I, I, I actually really liked it, so... Um, so hats off to all those guys in PDC for going out there slinging, um, like Greg Paulus, I think was the one that upset Ryan Windsor in the, in the first round. I mean, no, th thank you for ruining my fucking bracket, but like, congrats. <laughs> I mean, that's, um, I think that some of the PDC guys might've had a little bit of an edge because they had been playing. Yeah. So, you know, they kind of got their rhythm. They were under their sixth, seventh game and then they get to kind of step in the bracket and then before you know it, rocking and rolling. So, I mean, anyone else that you were impressed by? Um, Right off the top of my head, not really. I mean, Eric David. Oh, uh, all right. I'll touch on this. We've seen Alex Hicks play, right? Uh, he's twelve years old, super whiz kid. Uh, the Gore brothers. They tend to be a little bit more fiery, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think that they're they're still young, like they're still a little immature. But obviously, when I was twelve, I would have probably been the same way. Eric Davis, what sixteen, seventeen, right now? Yeah. Dude, like, if I was his dad. I would have, there was, I can't remember who he was playing, but there was a match where he was intentionally basically just throwing the bag like 50 feet in the air and trying to land on the board because he knew he was going to lose. I think it was like his, he threw his first bag off the back or Dude, something. Like, I would have grabbed that kid by his lose. fucking hair and dragged him off the court. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? You were supposed to be a professional. If I was Jason McCannon, I would have pulled him aside and be like, look what's on your chest, dude. You're representing my brand. You don't act like, you don't act like that. And I know, and listen, I get it that you're a competitor and you want to win. There's a right and a wrong way to do it. Yeah. You, there's a right. You go down swinging. You don't just give up. You don't just do that. Um, so I, I just, I feel like I want to see it because I think the kid's super, super talented. It's just the, the attitude. Like as soon as he starts to like, things aren't going exactly how he wants. He just fucking falls apart. And I, and I just, I want to see him take that next step mentally until he does that. He's not going to win a national. Well, it's like if he's going to win a national, it has to be in singles. I should say. Yeah. I mean, it has to be like perfect situation. Mm -hmm. for him right now yep like you said he just kind of kind of has that falling apart when he just misses a bag that yeah. he thought should go in like one hangs up on him like and i mean it, that'll come with maturity when it I, comes down to it though some of the big name rookies um like in air quotes made you know did exactly what we thought they did josh holland took third in the bracket alex Rawls took second tanner halpert another one had a nice had a nice run where did um where did Easy finish up at? Zockline was at right there, thirty seventh, tenth okay. in his bracket. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so yeah, I mean, some of the big names, you know, getting right in there. Um, so it was uh, Alan Rawls seventh in his bracket. I mean, uh, very solid. So Nick Williams, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed seventh with Chucky. in his bracket. Chucky taking sixth in his bracket. Oh yeah. I mean, Taco he's, Ochoa he's throwing great. Tacos throwing great. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, it was a Great, great round of singles. It was, it was uh, a lot of fun. We had, like you said, just some lesser name people make some runs, and yeah. it was cool to see, man. Like it, it's showing w this gauntlet of pros is now. Oh, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. All right, moving into doubles. So doubles, Kyle Malone and Cody Johnson they win over Jacob Trzinski and Storm Hog. So in first a off, very entertaining match. Very entertaining, but Cody Johnson, best hair in the game right now. Sexy AF, Dude, man, bro. He, I loved they, it. Man, I tell you what, he impressed the and hell out of he me. He threw fire in the finals. I mean, and Kyle Malone. I guess if you're going to give anyone MVP, it's Kyle Malone. Mm -hmm. He wins the doubles, and then he also wins the blind, the um, the pro blind draw. Um, I mean, Kyle Malone was stroking. I joked on Facebook like. Dude, if I'm a bag company, I'm going to I'm signing. If I'm going after anybody, I'm going. Kyle Malone is going to yep. get my bag on ESPN and get exposure <laughs> every year. That motherfucker Dude, should sign two. with a new bag company. Because <laughs> look, he first year kill shots on ESPN. The next year, <laughs> next year, he signs with Sure Shots. Shot. He gets them on the bag. Now, I will say the one downside, if I can offer Mike Norris some criticism, would be that. If I were if I weren't such a cornhole loser and I knew Kyle Malone was a sure shot sponsored player and Cody Johnson, I wouldn't have known what fucking bag that was. Yeah, because they were th they throwing a slick side down most of the time, right? 
I think they're throwing the loco. It's just it's a faster bag. I think that's what they're throwing with the locos. It was very. It was really like it was. It was hard to see black, and yeah. it was very. It was a dark bag. You want to you want to get something. I now I know they need to be like solid colors, but something a little brighter that your your name is going to pop a little bit. Because you're going to hit the market, obviously, cornhole losers like us, we're going to know, and, oh, hey, maybe if it worked for them, I'm going to go try it. But for the general market, like, that's how really, like, kill shots, I feel like, blew up. Because it, when they threw kill shots, it was right there on the fucking bag. Oh, and you could see the shooter shooter. Shoot, and and oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, um, that would be the only downside. But Kyle Malone, if you're a bag company and you're new and up and coming and you're like, oh, who should I sign? Kyle Malone will get your bag on ESPN, apparently. So then one more thing about that duo. we I texted you about it when I was watching them throw, like, Kyle Malone. Smoothest Best, throw in the game. I, Dude, one I of, mean, I want his throw. It is so smooth. Yeah, one off. I, I completely agree. He almost looks like he just wills it to where he wants the yeah. bag to land. It's so smooth. So you know why? It's always a. It's always a skinny dude. I know, dude. It's because we got we got these wide birthing hips. Dude, in the seriously, way. man. God damn it. I, I don't even have that, so <laughs> I can't even speak. But no, I completely agree. He's super smooth with his release. Um, he's somebody like when you watch him throw, you're like, oh, that's what that's what it should look like. Yeah. That's exactly the throw that you want to like try to teach people because it is so fluid. Correct. Um, but then we mentioned the uh, the you second place about, team. Yeah, Storm, and then you want to talk Storm about Hogan. the complete opposite. Yeah, Storm, Storm looks Hogan like just, he's spazzing out every time just he throws the bag, shot putting it in into where it goes. Um, but Jacob Trzinski, um, kid's fun to watch. Is he um, a fun? It, okay, not let's use the correct grammar here. Is he a more fun Jordan Power? You should have said funner. Um, I almost did. But uh, I mean, you get what I'm he's saying. He's a younger Jordan Power, and yes, I think he's not uh, as aggressive. You know, like a more likable. He's more likable. Okay, yeah. that's the way I get. Maybe I should have phrased it. That's kind. Of, honestly, I watched him play, and that's kind of what it reminded me of. He's fiery, but he's likable. Yeah, but it's like Jordan Power gets like the snarl look to him. Like he almost looks pissed off. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He Jacob Trzinski reminds me of. I mean, exactly what he is like a high school kid that's like in a state championship game. Like, oh yeah, yeah, excited, like he loved being like, there. Yeah, but yeah. that's. What, I mean, like he looked like he was enjoying himself. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you like you you miss that with power. And I I love Jordan. I I will watch Jordan Power play anytime because I love the mean mug and I oh, like yeah, the attitude. I love it. When I played sports, I was the same way. I was the biggest dick on the field. I knew I had to be because I wasn't the biggest. Yeah. So I had to be. I Nor was kind of an asshole. Dick. I just had to. Be, I'm just gonna go right over that. I had, I was kind of an asshole on the field, but I so I like that. But yeah, Trzinski kind of he's super entertaining. Um, I thought it was a great balance because Storm like is pretty stoic, doesn't do a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of emotion there. But somebody commented like, "Oh, I it was getting annoying every time Trzinski would release his bag and he'd like you would celebrate. Like, are you fine? Are you kidding me?" Yeah, the, I, are we dude, turning into golf right yeah, now? Yeah, that's that's like I loved it. I loved I it. like ha- I want his animation. Go- he would like yeah. throw a bag and like when it's in the air, he'd just like tighten up and watch it. Like that's dude, I loved watching that. It was great. Yeah, for so TV. hats off to them. Um, I was happy to see again like a newer team make the run, and then they listen. They beat uh, Windsor and Herrera. Yeah, to make it there. Make I it mean, there. that's oh, it was it no. Yeah, to they want to win the bracket. That's who yeah, they beat. and then they they beat. Uh, Ruben and Ruben Power. And Power. Yep, to get there. Yep, to get there, and then like Ruben and Power. Um, they they looked good until the, I think that that main stage. I mean, let's I, let's call it what it is. They it may melt it down a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I Jay Ruben giving up that. Are we six getting that spot backwards? Just, Did I mean, Ruben Power play them? Why am I not remembering I this remember. correctly? It was. There's so many blur. matches I watched today. I can't remember. I God damn! I, this is so embarrassing. I should. I don't remember who Birchfield and Rawls. But I thought Birchfield and Rawls. Did they play Malone and Johnson? They must have, right? I. Yeah, I think that's sort of. I think that's the bracket. No, no. I think we have it right. I think we have it right. I think it was. Uh, yeah, just pull just a fact check me. I don't know why I'm blanking out here for a second, but. Ruben Powers, they were throwing. I think they were throwing Widow X. It looked like maybe. Um, maybe I feel like if they would have gone with something, maybe just a little bit faster, like maybe thrown like a Viper, or maybe a Viper C, like it would have been a little bit more beneficial for them. Um, we'll go over this in a little bit, but the Widow X seems like it has just a slightly smaller template. It's a little bit slower on both sides. Um, yeah, so they're not going to have the, yeah, they're not going to have it on there. I, I just, I don't remember. It's not, it's not that big a deal. Anyways, like we know who was in the finals not, but regardless, Ruben Power, they're there, right? They won their bracket. So they did their job. They had a little bit of a hiccup, you know, gave up a little bit of a lead. So, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Um, but I, I 
I would like to know if they were throwing that bag all day because I know at least in singles, I believe Power was throwing Vipers. I don't know what Ruben was throwing in singles. I didn't get to catch any of his matches. Uh, but obviously the bag was working at least up to, to the point to get him to win the bracket. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Birchfield and Rawls. Yeah. Bur- I mean, it's hard to bet against Birchfield right now just because in doubles, like he just seems like he's getting it done all the time. He might have hit the biggest shot. It wasn't. And I, I and mean, again, I'm not trying to pin this on Alex, but Alex was, I think, the lights the first time on that stage might have gotten to him a little bit. Um, if you, I, I don't think Birchfield would admit that like he played his best game, but I thought that he held down his side pretty freaking well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And like I said, he hit, he hit like the biggest shot. Yeah, I mean that that airmail drag that he had. For oh, the, it's ridiculous! The bag in the front. I mean, it was it was money. It pumped tr- Burstfield up, which you never see. It was very oh, very, you're the most animated you're yeah, gonna see. Yeah, very cool to see him. But Alex Rawls and but... Burstfield, I'll be surprised if they don't if they don't make the finals or if they don't win a, a, a national doubles in one of these times. I mean, um, I, they they're just obviously a hard they're beat, there. Man, I mean, both of them are great, great players, and I think I think Rawls will find it on the main stage. He's he's too good to not. Yeah, I mean, listen, um, Kyle Malone and Cody Johnson, though, they earned it because they also, to win their bracket, they beat Jamie Graham and Matt Guy. Um, epic match. They beat them twice. They had to double dip them. They came from the loser's bracket, and they won. The surprise team coming out of left field that uh, Jay Rubin and Jordan Powers beat to make it to the broadcast. So happy to see them make a run. Singleton and Shermerhorn. Uh, welcome back, I guess. Absolutely, like, holy yeah. shit, like... And they just and needed sure a light of fire. Was just posted on Facebook leading into this how yep. poorly he had been throwing. Well, guess what, brother? You were just saving it for the right moment. Yep. So congrats to you two. Um Singleton might be one of my favorite players to watch play. I like watching both play. I mean, and, I think they're uh, both animated and they're they're good dudes to watch. So And they're they're just good dudes in general. Windsor Herrera, uh they battled um I believe Hogg and Trusinski double dipped them to make it to the broadcast. Um just anytime you can double dip those guys, that's that's tough. I mean, yeah. beating them twice in a row. Derek Holland and Josh Holland just lost a little bit of gas, but overall, um, I, again, I don't think that's the last time we're going to see him up there. Baldwin and Renner, unfortunately, they were just such a clusterfuck in that bracket where there were just so many good teams. You had uh, Renner and Baldwin, you had Graham and Guy, you had Malone and Johnson. You just had a whole bunch of really good teams all stacked there. Spees and Beamer. Um, they're looking really tough. Dude, Beamer, Beamer plays pretty well in singles too. And, uh, it's surprising cause we haven't like heard his name very much in our area recently. Um, I just didn't know which Beamer was going to show up. I mean, I, I mean, was worried because it was in Vegas and yeah, he's was, a young dude. Yeah, he he likes to, or... he likes to get after a little bit. And, uh, but he showed up and did well in singles and in he's doubles. So, he's very talented. And Eric Spies Ryder, just, and yeah. Cameron Presley went on a run, man. They took yeah. ninth. Uh, tied for ninth, and then Cameron Presley also won the blind, blind draw, draw yep. with Kyle Malone. Correct. Um, he's he's a great great thrower. Eric Ryder's always spoke very highly of him, but we've been on Presley since last year. I mean, he's yep. he's a good good player. A team that I've been high on all year. I've been writing about them since I uh, found out they were going to be pairing up. Modlin and Schlobaum. They also tied ninth. They're again they're a team that I fully expect to be a top. 20 if not top 20 team by the uh 15 team by yeah. the end of the season um i think that we'll see him make a broadcast at some point um they're just they they pair very very well i what i want to see is there's a point in that match where maudlin wanted schlobaum to lay up i think schlobaum wanted to shoot it schlobaum listened to frank and he laid up frank is ultra conservative but if Frank has that shot, he's fucking going for it. He's shooting it. Yep, 100%. You got to trust your fucking partner. Yeah. Gotta... I'm sorry. You got to go let Austin shoot. If you're going to have him as your partner, there has to be some level of respect for his game. So you got to let let the kid, let yeah, the young man fly. And Austin's been there enough that like he doesn't need a he doesn't need a, a papa bear for a partner. He no. needs just he just needs a partner. Yep. My favorite was um welcome back Derek King. Yes. Tied for 13th. Got it. they had a really t- they had a um, Birch Field or I'm sorry, they had Bernice and Gustafson first round. I believe so. Yeah. Smoked him. Smoked him. Um, yeah. I don't know what's going on with those two. Um, well, I, I know they gave me zero points in the draft. They so gave me the uh, wins. thank you. Boys. Yeah. Thank Thanks guys. Uh, but still, yeah, still love you. Derek King but... again, a sneaky, great doubles player playing with Devin Harbaugh. They, again, now that I know that it looks like Derek King is, is stroking again, they're going to be a team that you need to consider going deep in every single bracket, especially now with a better seed. Yeah. 
Obviously, Jackson and Jacob Gore, we talked about it before. They tied for 13th, a PDC player. Everyone wanted to see what will the Gore brothers do if they make it into a national bracket. Anytime you're, fi- you're finishing top 15, to me, that you're only two or three games yep. away from making a broadcast. Anything can happen. They're obviously there. They're right there. Absolutely. And, and I that, want to give one final shout out dude, to Cleveland boys, Chucky Love, Timmy Jonas. We've been saying we've been like Timmy's thrown. He's a different player this year. Yeah, he, and he looks, Chucky Love's been on another yeah, level recently too. I think so. Chucky finally found a bag that he's absolutely fallen in love for, yep. and he is throwing some heat. Um, so yeah, I was very happy to see them place uh, tied for thirteenth. I mean, yep. great job, boys. I mean, Timmy's been throwing great as of late so I'm, so I'm very happy to see that yep michael lucas jr and michael dingus again another ho-hum tied for 17th place it's just what they're gonna do so eventually they're gonna crack the top 10 um it's just every every time and then ryan smith eric anderson um i think if you ask them it's gonna be a disappointing 21st place yeah but i mean still tied for 21st they're there. i mean they're there all right so women's um Cheyenne Renner and Sarah Cassidy thank you very much because you guys put me over the top to win our little fantasy draft um you beat out Lori Duell and Connie Altice who are they the new second best team or is it too early would you still give that nod to Finley and Streaker I mean Streaker threw great this weekend I think Finley maybe didn't throw the best I, I think um, they're just Duel and all types are just a tough but team. Connie, we've been saying it all like in this offseason that Connie is on an absolute tear. Lori Duel, I mean, she's very consistent. So, yeah, dude, I mean, but it's also hard to vote against Moppin and Hunter, too. Cause so, l- let me ask you if, you if you had to bet, would you put all your chips on that Renner and Cassidy win the rest of the Nationals? 100%. Or they don't win anymore? I would put that they win the rest of it. I just I think that they're just a step ahead of everybody. I think that and Cassidy threw outstanding, so this is not a knock at Cassidy at all. I think just Renner is just that much better than everyone she's yeah. throwing against. Cassidy's a great doubles player. So she I think she just locks in for women's like like she did for the women's doubles and when she keeps throwing on that one side, she's hard to beat, man. Oh, and, it's just and Cheyenne is Cheyenne. I mean, if unless she has an off game, she's not losing. Yep. So I, yeah, I, I would I would put my money on them. I was happy to see Moppin and Hunter make the run. Um, they took second in their bracket. They obviously ran. They were on the same bracket as Renner and Cassidy. Um, they're they're a fun team to watch. It was funny. Because Moppin was throwing very very well. Hunter in it just she had some uncharacteristically poor rounds um, where she was throwing back short and just seemed to be. I don't know if she was just kind of fighting her throw a little bit. She was having a hard time. Um, I think they ended up changing bags the second time they played Renner and Cassidy, I think they were throwing, I want to say maybe the torch the first time. And then they switched over to the vengeance. The second game, I, it just seemed like she just wasn't real comfortable the whole time. Moppin can throw whatever the hell she wants. I mean, she Moppin, can sling. like, I, it baffles me how hard she throws that goddamn bag. I mean, that bag doesn't leave no. more than a foot and a half off nope. the ground the whole way. There. Oh, both insane. of them do though. Keely yeah. Hunter's the same thing. I mean, their bags are low, hard, mean right at the board, right at it. I mean, just Moppin just looks so angry throwing her back. It's and so she's like the biggest sweetheart ever. Oh yeah, yeah, no, she's so she's nice, very nice. It's just like it. I, I just don't get how she ever gets a bag to stop. All right, one topic before we get to the bag review. I want to kind of breaking off of our topic before about like not making it on the broadcast and everything. Do you think that knowing going forward, like if you win your bracket in singles? And you don't, and unless you are playing in the finals, you're not going to get airtime. Do you think that's going to negatively affect bag sponsorships going forward for the non like top 20 players in the game? Because I did a, if you want to do some reading on last year, I broke it all down after three nationals where realistically there were like, I think it was nine to 11 players that had a realistic chance of winning the world championship just based on what we were seeing, because it was the same nine to 11 players that are consistently finishing top. Uh, I think it was top four. Top, yeah. Yeah. It was in all top season, four, all season. If you're going to narrow it down that much now, is it going to get, I'll be interested to see if it gets broader this year because the talent is deeper. I think that's probably going to be the case, but if you know, if it, let's say it's consistent again, let's say it's nine to 11 players that all that are always at the top for singles. 
if you're playing the odds game, I mean, that's what five percent chance that your bag's gonna make it on ESPN ever. Yeah, I mean, does I, that does that play a factor? I was never one to think that your bag sponsor should be your biggest sponsor. No, no, I don't think so. But there are bag sponsor, there are bag manufacturers that are sponsoring big name players because they want their bags to be seen. They want that kill shots effect to blow the fuck up. They yeah. want to get outside the cornhole market and reach those fringe players where they're like, like us. First bags I ever bought, local bags. Why? Because I saw Cody and Adam wearing fucking local across their chest, and I saw their bags. Yeah. Works for them. They win. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll buy a set, too. And I can win, too. It didn't work. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. You know, Do you think it's going to hurt it long term because of the limited opportunities that there are going to be on a broadcast? 100%. And I, I also don't think uh, there's going to be nearly as many pro stamp bag makers. Yeah, I mean, I think it's only a matter of time before ACL will raise the price that it's going to cost per set of bags. Yeah, I agree. And then that's that's going to eliminate some of these bag makers from just kind of lumping But then, let me ask you, it, it's expensive to be a pro. Yeah. Travel, if you start doing that big time, and then the ACL is not paying players to be pros, how many of them are really going to be able to keep up doing it? Like, how many, able, or how many people are going to be able to afford it? I mean, it's it's been something that I've been saying for a long time. I mean, it's not cheap to be a cornhole player. Do you think right now, with how where it's at, nothing changes where people are going independent sponsors, all that stuff, do you think this model is sustainable? No. I, I have a hard time seeing it, man. I, I just don't see... Not for the lower tier guys exactly. who have no bag sponsorships. And... That's why I always thought the pro division should be, like... A hundred players. I mean, it's just, it baffles me. Like if you're a lower tier pro, and again, this is not like a knock on anybody. If you're a lower tier pro and you don't have, let's say $20,000 in sponsorship money. So maybe $20,000 will cover your travel costs for all this stuff. If it covers, covers all your travel costs. Okay. And you have another job on the side. All right. Maybe, maybe it's a wash. Like I can see that. Yeah. But if you're not getting any money from your sponsors, that's covering the travel costs, you're at a net loss by the end of the year. Is it really worth it? Maybe if you really love the game and this is what, that's just your goal. And that's what you want to do. Well, maybe see, it's the, worth it. The game has moved past that. Point. That's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. Cause it's like, I mean, it's, it's no longer to, just it's like a backyard that game that you're a pro at. This is considered a sport. It's on ESPN. They're trying to make it an Olympic yeah. sport. Like when you, when you have guys practicing, six days a week for multiple hours. And uh, on the flip side, you know, they, they're showing stuff like the, the super hole and stuff rather than, you know, showing the second yeah. place or the semifinals and in, in singles. Yeah. I, I don't see it being sustainable for the lower. I mean, I know that they talked about having two broadcast times. I guess what they, they did. You had two broadcast slots. Yeah. I get why the Super Bowl is important for the sport. I do too. I it's like... entertaining. People are going to stop and watch. I think, if I'm being completely honest, it's a little bit of like a circus show. Can we, like, can we talk are... Super Bowl real quick though? Because fucking Chumley, dude. Like, it's how there, there, is there it? was two players that play cornhole regularly yeah. on there. And then you had two other guys that, now I'll give Helmuth credit. He was he, okay. He did okay. Average had player. some practice, but yeah. then like Eric Anderson gets gets fucked over with Chumley, who just couldn't even put a bag on the board. I mean, like bad. Like why would you even invite him? Like to me, that makes the sport look gimmicky. Correct. That's what I'm saying. It made it like, look like a circus almost. Now having so, Kirby win it was awesome. If I'm scrolling through and I'm like, oh, they have player. a cornhole. Like oh, look, okay, I'll stop by and watch. And I'm seeing like a player that's not even hitting the board. Like the fuck is this? Yeah, exactly. Like that's not entertaining. I for get anyone. that is. I get. I get why it's a great marketing tool for the ACL to use and broaden out. I I get, one hundred percent get it. as a fan of the sport, as someone that, fucking talks about it every week on a podcast. I'm just not interested in it. That I guess, but I guess I'm not their market though, right? My to me, I I under like, I guess we're we're not the market for that to grow the sport. But at the same time, I think if you had athletes doing it or somebody like um the dude from SWAT like clearly he throws he's athletic yeah he can play the game like that should be where the super hole is geared towards I'm not gonna lie I think I think Lim right yeah I'm I'm pretty sure he walked into it been like we're oh, we're gonna, gonna roll it. yeah and then... we're we're gonna roll through this and then Kirby's like hold on motherfucker I got you and uh yeah he was by far I mean I mean I would love to see his PPR had to be a, a nine five I mean, for for the first game, for sure. 
I mean, the second one he was definitely messing around a little bit more. A so. little bit. He had a one or two bad rounds where yeah. he was off off the back and stuff. But I guess I'm not. I'm. I know I'm not the target audience for the Super Hole. Like, and that's fine. I just like I would rather if we want to see the sport grow. I would rather give that opportunity to put on all four matches, put on the semifinals of singles. Yeah, I agree. On that night, and then save the final match for the next day and do all the finals one day. That's fine with me. But I just feel like this, again, this missed opportunities for bad companies that are putting in work. And not just bad companies, but all the other sponsors that these guys are all like when they hand out their little sheets to the sponsors. And they're like, you might, you might, your logo might get seen on ESPN. Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's, it's not. You have like a, like I said, probably less than 5% chance that your shit's going to get seen. Yeah, but it could be seen on ACL Digital Network walk in the background or something. It could. <laughs> it could. I just, yeah. To me, like, if you if you limit the Super Bowl to like just one game. Yeah, like if you just had like Lim versus Kirby in that one, that would have been super entertaining. Then the winner of that moves on to the yeah, you know the final the final whatever thing that they have. But but again, I, again, it's not a knock. It's just I know I'm not their target audience. It to me it comes off a little bit gimmicky. I would just rather see the sport and the best players doing it and representing the game rather than just pairing them with somebody like just a random backyard guy. But I know it's a cool experience for the pro players. They get to interact with different stars and stuff. Yeah. That's cool. Like I get that. It's a cool experience, right? Just for the overall growth of the game, like as for sponsorship money and looking at from a player's aspect and potential earning in the future. I don't know if that's necessarily the right step. We'll see. Maybe it is. Maybe a company's watching that and be like, Oh, well maybe I'll sponsor the ACL and then that'll produce a bigger prize pool for next year. I don't know. I'm just saying right now, I just, I would rather see the game being played by professionals than everything else. But anyways, I agree. All right, let's go ahead and move over to the bag review. And the bag review is brought to you as always by bags board, the maker of the original cornhole bag backpack. Now offering you a build your own feature that has over 10,000 combinations to choose from. Need patches going that sweet ass bag bags board has some of the best around visit bagsboard.com and grab yours today. All right, so we're going to rapid fire through these. These are three new series of bags, new-ish series of bags by Ultra, the three newest ones. Um, so we're going to rapid fire. I think there's a decent amount of people that have probably thrown these, but if you haven't and you're like, do you want to pull the trigger or not? Let's do the it. answer's yes. We're going to start off with the Psycho X. The Psycho X. Um, I, re- I really like this bag. It is a linen, slow like based slow side. And then you have um, like a game changer slick side. So we're gonna go like uh, like a six, right? Maybe maybe a hair slower, five, maybe a five. I mean, depends on what condition. You're yeah, like five, in. six on the slow side, nine, ten on the slick side. Um, super hole forgiving once this bag breaks in. It's a little bit stiff when you get it, but I mean, I literally like did a quick sack, material. relax, wash, dried, and these things turn into butter. I mean, yeah. these excellent playability. The thing with linen, we've said this before, it is very variable based on board conditions. It can play like super fast on super slick boards, or if the boards are sticky, this is going to play almost like suede. You, if the boards get a little bit slow, the nice thing about linen is you can cut yes. this bag pretty well. Um, if you're somebody that doesn't throw a super, super flat bag, I don't think I would necessarily recommend this bag. You're better off going with the traditional Psycho, I think. Correct. Or like a Viper or something like that. Because yeah. this linen will tend to grab at times um, and move. So if you don't throw a super flat bag, it's probably not the best fit for you. Um, overall template, the bag just, it feels big. Yeah, I mean, it's it's perfectly made for the materials on it because it just grabs the hole yeah. so easy when you push it, it. It's a, it's very well pushed. Um, it's not like overly floppy. There is enough ass behind it where you can kind of push through on either side of the bag. Um, I, ultra is got one of the best closing seams. I mean, it's just flawless. I mean, it's just like, you don't even tell, like, you can't even tell where the closing seam is half the time. I have a, I have a hard time. So I'm a seam thrower. So I've been throwing these Viper bees. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to tell where the seams are. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's flawless. I mean, it. that's one of the things like craftsmanship of of ultra bags is second to none. I mean, it's it's right up there with some of the best made bags in the business. Um, overall, again, it, it's a really nice bag. It's hole forgiving. So if you're looking for something with a controllable slow side, but with a super slick slick side, you know that's gonna make the bag super hole forgiving. Psycho X is gonna be a very nice option for you. I agree. Yeah. Design. I mean, I love their clean looks. I always have. I think they're they're nice looking bags. So we have the teal, 
Yeah. The teal and green. It pops. I, I like the color. I mean, it's it's nothing like crazy fancy. Give me, give me an 78. Yeah, I'm going to go flat 80. Okay. It's, it's solid. I like yeah. the colors. I mean, obviously, I picked them out, so I like it. Um, performance score. Um, I like this a lot. Um, I throw it really well. I mean, I, I've always been a big fan of Vipers and Viper C. And then this kind of is just like that step down from that. So I like seeing the thought process of what's going on, like in the bag creation and having a whole arsenal of kind of speeds and everything. This is a nice step down from like a, like a Viper. Yeah. Like this would be like the next little baby step. Um, I'm going to go with 84. Okay. Um, it's a little quick for me. Um, and I'm not the biggest fan of linen when I throw it just because the variability, it changes. It, it can does. Change it so does. much. But it is super hole forgiving though. Yeah, I mean, it, it really it's is. great stuff to um, throw if you're just trying to hole hunt. I'm just too afraid to throw that game changer fast side exclusively if that linen starts catching. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I, I'm gonna give it a 74. Okay. Um, but yeah, you you can't deny its whole friendliness. It's it's a good bag. All right, Widow X. Oh, we're going Widow. X. Oh, you're saving. Yeah, we'll save okay. the Viper B for the okay. end. So Widow X. Um, I know some people had uh, wanted to know like they get confused with the, the X and the B and all that stuff. So basically the X is what I'm assuming it's got is the linen, it's it. the linen yeah. right? So it's that controllable slow side. So again, like a five, six on the slow side, the difference on this bag is that instead of it being widow material for the slick side, it's actually reversed to widow. Yeah. So when you first get it, it's going to have like that um, waxy kind of film feel to it. If you wash it and you throw it in the dryer, it, I mean, it's going to feel like a, a, like a widow pretty much yeah. in your hand. So the only downside with this, and we were actually talking about, this has a, it has a smaller template than like the Psycho. If we put these two together. I mean, it definitely feels It feels thicker. small, right? Just slightly smaller? It's small. Yeah, look, okay. look it up over here. Yeah. Right so the, the Widow X is definitely a little bit smaller of a template. The one thing we were talking about before we um, hopped on the show is that the speed differential is pretty minimal on this. So you have like a five, six on the linen side. I'm going to say like maybe a seven on the slick side. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I was going to give it like a five, six slow side and then six, seven fast side. I mean, yeah. it's not big variable difference, but now the reverse widow, both. that reverse widow material is typically like one of my favorite slow sides to play. Like I love that slow side. Yeah. Um, it's probably the true fast side of this bag though, in my opinion. It is. Yeah, it is. Well, what I'm saying if I'm normally when it's a, it's made with like, you'll see a lot of like the reverse widow material with like Viper. Yeah. I love that combination. It's like right up there with my favorites. Um, but I, I liked it. It's just, I, I like having a better, I like having a, a faster slick side just so I have a little bit more options if something's kicking or I'm not throwing in it. And again, if you're playing with a better slick side or something faster, typically it's going to be a little bit more hole friendly. I don't know for a fact. I think that's what Ruben and Power were throwing, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm not. I, I couldn't see the bag. I well want to enough. say it is because I think this was the. I want to say this is the Jordan Power color is that, is that scheme. I color think scheme? so. I, I I'm not. I sure. can't remember. I won't speak on it. Um, <laughs> design. Design for me. Um, I've always liked the widow. Design. Dude, honestly, the reverse widow prints so well. It it's so clean on that side. It is. Um, I really do. I like this color scheme a lot. The purple and lime green. It's yeah. just it's unique. It pops. Um, yeah, give me a ninety. I think this one's cool. I, I I have always liked the widow design. Um, we had the first. I mean, widow one. The first. Dude, I still have Gen One downstairs. The, the black white. and white. Oh, oh just, dude, they're still. Sexiest. So I mean, they're, you know. A, a little yellow yeah now, you know, <laughs> a little gray but um design wise i'm gonna go with go 85 it's just because standard but it's, it's very solid performance wise where are you going with this performance for me um I, I did like it a little bit more than the psycho x um just because it was a little bit more controllable the thickness though does take away from its whole friendliness it a little does, bit a little bit um but i like to throw a thicker bag okay. typically I'm going to go just a little bit above the Psycho X and give me a 75 on that one. Okay. I'm going to go less. So I was at 84 for Psycho X. Widow, uh, Widow X, I'm going to go a little bit lower. I'm going to go... I Because it's hard because I like both materials. I just like them separate. If yeah, yeah you, want, you want a faster side. Huh? Um, yeah. So I'm going to go I'm gonna go 75. I still liked it. Again, just want something a little bit faster with Copycat. it. Copycat. All right. Last but not least, we got the Widow or the Viper B. Yes. Um, I'll let you take it. I mean, you've been talking about this. Yeah. So, um, 
Viper B, it's the same template as the Psycho X, so a little bit bigger. Um, it plays pretty much like surefire-ish on the slow side. It's yeah. uh, It's got that like f- like four-ish, um, if it's... If it gets a little humid, yeah, yeah, it could get it, pretty it, tacky. It if it's it. pretty yeah. sticky if, it, um, if it's slow boards. But this thing is hole friendly, just like a Viper is. Yeah, um, it slinks into the hole very nicely. This is it's, this is Ultra's so like this is Ultra's answer to a Surefire. Yeah, basically, absolutely. If yeah. we're if we're gonna call it, and what it is. Uh, but it's got that uh like game changer on the fast yep. side, um, paired with that Surefire esque material on the slow side. And I'll tell you what, man, it's a, uh, it's a great bag. I've been throwing the heck out of it. Um, we mentioned the seams before and do this, this seam is specific. Like it's almost like built into the top. Like it's yeah. almost a seamless bag on this one. Um, so it's, it, the craftsmanship is next level. Um, I really like, even though it is a bigger template, I just like that it's a slower bag yeah. with a bigger template because it does Kind of like I like the little slip into the hole. Like well, it's with easier one to grab in. too. You know exactly. What I mean? like yeah. It's a, all their templates are it, it, widow. It seems to be like a little bit more rounded. Yeah, they're not they're not square bags, but they're they're rounded. But it just it plays so fucking big yeah. on the boards. And I I will say the the fabric pairing the game changer is just smart with it because it makes the push just so easy with yeah. it. Yeah, it, it grabs and pours bags in the hole. Um, Design score for me, um, I like this color scheme. I love this we color We got scheme. like a, a pink and baby blue, a um, little North Carolina blue, if you will. Um, yeah, I'm going to go I'm gonna go 88 on that design. I design, I'm a big fan. I don't know why. I just think the pink and the blue really pop. I'm going to go 92. I nice. really like And I've always liked the Viper design. Um, it was. It's hard for me because Viper and Viper C are right up there with my favorites. Viper B performance-wise, again, it's a little slower than I would like. I mean... If you're, if I'm gonna be honest, I would rather still throw a Viper or Viper C. Yeah. But like for me and you, this might be a good like middle ground for us, because mm-hmm. um, I can always just flip it over and if I need to. But I, I still felt comfortable throwing the slow side. And it's it's good to note that these all feel like Vipers. Though. Correct. Like they all feel, feel in your hand like consistent. you're throwing a Viper. I'm gonna go in 81 on performance. Okay. Uh, for me, I'm dude. I'm going high. I've been throwing this bag really, really well. It's kind of uh, helped me get on my funk, if you will. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna. Dude, I'm gonna go ninety. Nice. I like it that much. It's a. It's you a haven't good been bag. in nineties in a while. So I know. Not, yeah, right. it's a. I've. I think it's just because I've been throwing it well. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I think it's that magic time where you're going to cue the, cue rap, the rap horn. horn. Reaches at Instagram and Twitter at Big Ass Cornhole. And Facebook at Big Ass Cornhole Podcast. Thanks again to our sponsors. Visit AirwolfAthletics.com for all your cornhole swag. Be sure to use code Big Ass to get yourself ten percent off, and localbagcompany.com for the best bags in the business. Bagsport.com for the sexiest backpacks and patches in the game, and blackjackcornhole.com for the sexiest bags around. Code Big Ass is going to save you ten percent. Patreon, what's up? Hell if you're yeah. listening to the show and you're a fan of the show, buy us a beer a month. Hop on to www.patreon.com/slash/bigasscornhole and join our Patreon community that we're slowly building. Um, our new members want to give them a quick shout out to Sean Mullen, Nick Williams, Tiffany Key, who is um, Mrs. Big Daddy. Yeah, I was going to say. Kevin DuPont, Ms. William Whitehurst, Louis Armas, Cameron Pochi, Shem Hanks, Jason Gunn, Tom Whittem, Ryan Thompson, and the Bag Examiner. Mm. That's, what it, that's what it was. So um, shout out to you guys. Again, if you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a community that we release our episodes. Um, we do polls on topics to talk about, um, give you up-to-date information on anything that's going on behind the cornhole uh, scene. We do some happy hour Zoom calls. We've done one where we'll do another one, perhaps when we're in Kansas City. I think that might be a good a good thing to do one of those nights when we're bored, um, if there's time. Um, but yeah, so we offer three tiers, $5.00. 10 and $20. If you are a member of the 10 or $20 tier, you're going to be eligible for bag giveaways. Um, almost weekly. We've been doing one like every other week right now, Mm -hmm. but we greatly appreciate your support for the price of a beer a month. You can help us keep going and you can feed us. Yeah. We need it. We love it. Clearly. (laughs) Clearly. All right. Well, um, yeah, so stay tuned. We're going to be joined by ACL pro Doug Zaft and owner of ultra cornhole, Mark Pryor. Fantastic. Well, as always, we hope you throw it straight, and it's nothing but four baggers from here on out. Cornhole it. Later.
So most of you may come to us for your cornhole answers. Well, if you need to buy stuff, don't call us. Hit up CornholeSolutions.com to solve all of your cornhole problems. They have the best boards in the business. If you use code BIGASP, get yourself 10% off those fantastic boards. So visit CornholeSolutions.com and grab yourself a set today. Just do it. Do it. Welcome back to the Big Ass Cornhole Podcast. We are now joined by ACL Pro Doug Zapt and owner of Ultra Cornhole, Mark Pryor. What's going on, guys? Hey, buddies. How you guys doing? Doing well. We're doing well. Not as uh, warm as you guys because we're in Cleveland, Ohio, where it's currently like five degrees out, so it kind of sucks. So I'm a little jealous of you guys. It's uh, raining here in San Diego, so don't be too jealous. (laughs) My uh, car door was frozen shut this week. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, okay, not that bad. So, Doug, obviously you had an exciting weekend. So before we get to you, um, I know Mark, has, he's a little bit short on time, so we're going to just brush up with him. Mark, can you let us know a little bit, like how did you kind of um, in, get involved in the game of Cornhole? I mean, ever since I was a you know, small kid, I used to play in the back uh, yard of my grandparents' house. They had a okay. small... Um, you know what they would call bing bag toss board. It was like a two foot by two foot with a you know six inch hole in the center of it, and just really fond memories of playing with my uncle and my grandfather and my brothers and my cousins. You know every time we'd go and visit them in Pittsburgh, um, the McKeesport area. Okay. And so, just always a fond memory. And uh, you know around 2007, I was you know aerospace engineer doing you know, hardcore engineering for, you know, spacecraft related technologies. And then I started just thinking, well, you know, I'd like to do something that's a little bit, you know, funner because, you know, anytime I talk about it, people seem to, you know, uh, phase out and get, you know, (laughs) I lose them when I talk about aerospace. (laughs) So I want to talk about stuff that was like entertaining and, um, you know, Cornell kind of creeped in my mind there. And yeah, so 2007, I kind of rented a space and um, at first I was doing baseball bats, like wooden baseball bats. Okay. And um, Cornell was kind of like, I was doing that a little bit too. And then, you know, started taking off more and more. In 2013, I quit my job and went full-time Cornell. So pretty much it, you know. It, so you've it, been doing start- this since 2013 full-time? Yeah, full-time 2013, but, you know, super heavy into it from, like, maybe 2009 to, you know, 2013, and then just kind of got too busy to juggle, you know, full-time aerospace gig plus, you know, orders that started raining down in April, you know. Yeah. It was just getting – it was very seasonal at that point in time, you know, a lot more seasonal than it is now. Luckily, this whole league thing and the the growing of the sport has – um you know, washed out kind of the peaks and valleys of the sport, which is great. You know, a lot of these bag makers really and other board makers can't appreciate what we, you know, used to go through. Um, maybe they can, I don't know. It's, you know, with the bags and the sport, the way it is, it's kind of uh, leveled, you know, the sales throughout the, the year for us, which is really nice. So in 2013, I mean, you, you couldn't have had, um, there really had, couldn't have been that, that much competition back in 2013. Did you primarily focus on selling regionally or were you still like a national kind of commodity, I guess if you want to call it? Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, Doug, when was the first time we, um, we met? I think it was like at a mega gate, right? It was, I was just going to say, uh, before Stacy got ACL going, uh, he was doing tailgate games and had a mega gate kind of awesome tournament. And it involved Cornhole as one of the tailgate games, obviously, and it was out West. And however he linked up with you, I don't, I never heard that story, but uh, me and a few of the other Arizona guys, you know, were like, this looks awesome. Let's go out there. We formed a team. And that was the first time I met Mark, but I can't remember. That was a great time. I think that was, was it 2010 or 2011 Vegas? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. Yeah, we have some photos from back then that I could dredge up if necessary. We we're, we're already talking about photos that Nick Feinstein had showed us of Doug yeah. or, or of early days. So it's all right. We have we have a little bit of blackmail. So as long as he behaves, we'll be good. I just couldn't we'll be believe you had an afro. <laughs> Doug still looked like an elite athlete back then. You wouldn't believe it. So. 
Mark, do you still um do you still play often now? Um, not really. I'm irrelevant as a player. Do you enjoy? I mean, it? I, I enjoy it, but okay. I, I don't know. Something happened to where I really suck now. So hey, join the club, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, we talk about it every week, but uh, shit. I mean, I'm happy when I average like a seven PPR right now. Well, I, I yeah, gotta ask you. I mean, would actually all be these a, bags. I mean, what do you like PPR to throw yourself right now for me? So what, what bags are you throwing when you, when you step up to the boards, Mark? Viper. I mean, Viper. yeah, I haven't really been playing enough to kind of, you know, <clears throat> have the bags make a difference. You know, my main problem is just repetition and practice. You just, you, that's what you need to do. You need to put in, I mean, Doug, be. for Christ's sake, he, his fingers turned black and blue <laughs> from how much work he'd put in. And that's the the pressure that he's applying on his fingertips as he releases the bag. They literally turn black and blue from how much work he's put in. Um, he probably has calluses, right? So that's what you need to do. If he threw, um, I believe, the final was like 11.33 against Alex Hicks. Yeah. And that was the first time I believe Alex Hicks lost all season. In a yeah, first time yeah, lost was against Doug Zaft at this national. And... Um, I mean, that's what you kind of do, got to do. And I honestly, my, me and myself, I haven't put in the work. I haven't, um, I still enjoy it. I'll still go out and, you know, I'm playing competitive now. Um, you know, a few years ago, I would have been advanced. I would have been somewhat relevant. Um, but everybody's, you know, so many people are putting in, you know, the hours and, you know, they're, they're rising up out of everywhere that are just these solid players. I mean, I think the main advantage they have now that um, we didn't have back then was just the sheer amount of people that are willing to kind of help you develop your throw, like your, your parents are throwing constantly. So you're learning how to do a proper, you know, spin, you know, and just the evolution of that has really grown. Um, oh yeah. Completely agree. So uh, it's talking about Doug here for a second. So you, you sponsor, obviously Doug's a, uh, an ultra sponsored player and you sponsor a pretty large number of players in the ACL this year what sort of things do you look at when you're trying to decide if a player is for lack of better terms, like ultra worthy? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, ultra worthy, you know, I thought you, I had a nice you, have to, <laughs> you have to, you know, you have to be a, a first and foremost, say, a, you know, a, a decent person. I think most people in Cornell are cool. So that box gets checked pretty readily. Um, you know, I, I don't think the team really would want to deal with, you know, people that have like these attitudes or they're not really, you know, team players that, I don't know, it's kind of a big part of it. I think Doug, you probably would have felt that a little, little bit this national where we had the party. It was just a really great atmosphere. Yeah. And I saw that question come through in the chat. I mean, for me, I think it's more important that we're just, it's bigger than ultra. We're all ambassadors of Cornhole, right? So when we're at the locals and the regionals. And you've got all three divisions there and we keep seeing the same folks over and over. You know, it's important that, I mean, I, I encourage all of them. I'm always kind of like, hey, when you get up, you know, it looks like you're ready to move up. You know, we want them to keep coming back, right? So we just want to keep fostering, um, you know, the competitive side, but also just having fun and being, like Mark said, like reasonably good people, right? That you want to yeah. be around. Um, and then if they, you know, happen to like me, my personality, my game, whatever they see, I'm throwing ultra, you know, that's great. There's, you know, lots of options out there, but I think it starts with the person first. You kind of like align to that person, that personality. And, you know, if they want to go the next step and, you know, try the same bag, that's great. Yeah. I think the second <laughs> thing would be, you know, and it's kind of a tie, right? We have um, uh, probably PPR and, you know, social media abilities. I don't know if it's a tie. I mean, we had this discussion, Rich and a few of the other ultra leaders, we were talking about like, okay, what do we really want in a player? Well, I'm like, you know, PPR, right? Other, other people are saying, hey, you know, these, if somebody doesn't know how to use social media, what, what good is that for ultra? Well, I'm like, I mean, it's not all about like, oh, blasting ultra everywhere. It helps, right? You want to be able to have players that can, you know, be brand ambassadors. Um, yes. But, you know, PPR, you really can't, you really can't teach that, you know, um, you can kind of show somebody how to use the computer pretty quick and say, this is how you post a photo of yourself 
you know, in a win, right? But, you know, PPR just comes with hours and hours and hours of training skill. Some things are just not, you know, going to be, you know, capable of achieving, right? I mean, I can never achieve what Doug is doing right now. Um, you know, and then you look at Matt Guy, nobody's able to achieve what Matt Guy's doing right now. I mean, the dude is a beast, you know? I think Doug, I mean, going into uh, that finals, you know, what were you feeling? I mean, there, you always have a chance, but you're probably thinking, okay, I need to throw like an 11 here, right? You need, you need to be yeah. an 11. Yeah, I mean, everyone knows Matt's game. Um, it's pretty much a given strategy. Right, uh, everyone has the same approach. A uh, a blocker close to the hole is your best chance because he's he's the most aggressive. Got to admire him for it, but usually he'll hit it. But if they bounce off, you know, there's points, and those are about the only points you're getting. Um, so, yeah, for me, I mean, I had the winner's mentality Friday. Was feeling it Saturday. I kind of knew. I just I wasn't quite as on point as as Friday. So I was kind of struggling mentally, mentally with that. Um, but do you, yeah. do you wish that the, looking back on it, do you think the result, I, I, obviously we're using a crystal ball here. If you would have played the finals Friday, do you think the result would have been different? It would have been a, a different game, much better game. Yeah. Okay. I would have given him like a real game Friday, I feel, because I was just, I just carried that momentum all day. I never lost it. I mean, honestly, you be, you be Dylan Turpin, who in my mind, watching him and who he had had to go through was yeah. the hot hand right there. Ed um, Dylan, oh my goodness. I mean, well, he, he was on fire. I mean, he Tanner. I mean, beat Tanner Halper twice. I mean, hand, I mean, I, it just was really throwing really well. Did you, the one thing Dylan had written um, on Facebook the following days, he thought after he won the bracket, he was done. Like, so he, you know, mm -hmm. kind of mentally checked out, he said a little bit, and he had to kind of fire himself up to play you again. Did yeah. you know that you were playing that semifinal match that night? Uh, I heard I, at one point I didn't, but then someone said, no, they're actually going to play these out. You know, it's only the final two on TV. And so, you know, someone happened to be around and tell me that. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I wasn't like on my way out of the arena or anything. I just kept, all right, I'm going to stay warm one more game. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of locked out on that one. Okay. There's a huge momentum shift in that game. Yeah. You yeah, were up like 15 to that. two or, yeah. or something? No, I mean, hey, any game can have a, I mean, they usually will have those kind of shifts, um, you know, at the pro level. So I got the fast start. He was giving me open holes. I wasn't doing anything crazy. I just, you know, throwing him in. And he switched bags. Before he, I saw that post, he said he switched and maybe wished he hadn't. So I think he honestly used half the game to get those bags just dialed in, and then he got them, right? Yeah. Now he's facing a real turpin, and it was a battle, right? He's kind of survived. One thing I like to – what I like watching you play is that you throw Vipers, right? It's a, Obviously, it's known as a pretty, you know, faster bag, if you will. Yeah. Do you still play kind of a dirty style game? Like you do, you're, you play, you have one of the best bully bags, I think, in the game. And I think it's underrated because you throw the bag pretty deep, right? Yeah. So, I mean, but you really, you're not afraid to kind of like nickel and dime. Like you'll take your two, right? Just bully their bag just not enough. Yeah. So that they're not going to even try to bring that bag back and play. Is that, is that how you've always kind of played or is that kind of just developed over time? It's developed. I think it's, um, being out west with generally faster conditions, you, I mean, I have a lighter throw, right? I have a kind of a toss. I would say I really don't throw it. I toss it. So I've had to learn to throw. I've just developed that way uh, just to keep the bags on the board. Um, so that's kind of always hung with me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I like doing a little side shot. I mean, a lot of people just kind of go through it or get behind it. But I, I mean, if I've got an angle, any slice of an angle, with those hyper bags, they're kind of just, they're able to kind of morph beside it and go in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that shot really works for me. Um, so I, just, I kind of, I keep doing that. At least it did this weekend, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else made it work this weekend. So. A couple of times I saw Doug throwing, I'm like, you know, he's, he's a, he's a step out artist, right? He, he finds those angles and he's brilliant with them. You know, if you can create an angle by stepping out, you know, he's, he's doing it and he's usually hitting that shot, you know, um, nudging the other person out of the way, just gaining a little bit more hole control on a bag that was like dead center. 
by like stepping out a little bit and doing a bit of a bully. Um, yeah, I think it's a great style. I mean, it's just, you're just trying to make the, your opponent's life just any little bit more difficult. You know what I mean? Cause then you're obviously, then you're going to have, you know, a higher percentage of scoring some sort of points out of it. So it, it's a style that I think it's overlooked right now, especially with the flop and roll factor coming into right. it right now yeah. and stuff. But um, I think I, if anything, if, you know, all the younger dudes are looking at it right now, besides Noah Wooten, all right, there hasn't been anybody that's won a national that's been flopping and rolling a bag yet. So it's still put more bags in the hole than your opponent. doesn't matter how it does it, but it seems like the slide game and airmail is still king right now. And that's just it. I'd rather, I mean, I like getting in the hole. Like that's always my first priority is like, if I can get in, I'm going to get in. If I feel like it's, it's there, you know, and make them, make them push their bag in. Right. It's, it's yeah, you, see Matt Guy, you see Matt Guy throw and he has not the prettiest bag in Cornell. No, I was just no. watching a slow-mo um, shot of his bag and, and the way it's wobbling out of his hand. Oh, it's like a dead duck. You know, He's but by the time it got to the board, it actually kind of leveled out and it was pretty flat. Um, that just goes to show you, you know, that the game of Cornell, um, you see these players trying to get real cute, you know, and trying to look real sexy. And I get that. It looks cool as hell. <laughs> um, when it comes down to it, you know, he has a 56% four bagger average. Okay. Which the next highest pro is 39%. And this was, you know, with the ACL software and it didn't include the nationals, but I mean, that's telling you something right there. Look at your four bagger percentage. You know, are you 28? Are you 25? You know, are you trying to get a lot of torque on the bag? Is that torque creating a problem with accuracy? You know, um, that's kind of the other thing I look at too, is like, okay, you know, are you a player that wants to look super flashy or are you a player that wants to get the job done? You know, because at the end of the day, those people I want to get the job done are making those deep runs. You know, it'd be great to have both, right? Uh, oh, well, I think yeah. Jay Rubin has both. Um, I think Jordan Power is more of a get the job done, but he just looks really great, great doing it. You know, Zaft, his, his bag looks really good, it's, but it's, you know, it's very kind of straight out of the hand. He's not going to throw a lot of, you know, torque off of it. His arm's not finishing way across his body. So... Well, you, you put it perfectly though, Doug. You you said that you you toss the bag rather than throw it, and that's exactly right. how I would. Like, that's me. Yeah, uh, that's how I do exactly. It. It's the same way. He's got a very soft toss, and it hits the board. Like, whereas if I try to do that, I lose all my accuracy because I'm used to throwing things hard. Like that's how I grew up. I'm used to like throwing like, yeah. like everything hard, even if it's underhand. It doesn't matter. And I think it's a product of where you live. Like all the you know southeast guys with the high humidity, all those Florida guys. I mean, they throw through wind, humidity. They got to throw the bag. I think they all started with the heavy suede bags, right? We didn't have vipers and the, all the slick bags way back then. So they're throwing in the heavy humidity wind with the heavy suede bag, right? You have to really throw the bag, right? If that's kind of the world they developed in, right? They're going to most likely kind of hang on to that throw somewhat, you know, their whole time, their whole, whole career. So you were, you were a swimmer at Cincinnati? Is yeah, that right? that's correct. Or Xavier, or Xavier, or something. Uh, well, University of Cincinnati. Okay. Okay. So well, like, yeah, so, okay, we gotta make sure we get that right. Yeah, we right. gotta get like, that right. So you're <laughs> okay. at, you're at UC. So did, were you playing cornhole at all there? Because you should have developed that low hard toss in Cincinnati. You know, it's crazy. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, and then went to swim at University of Cincinnati. The first time I ever saw cornhole was at Cincinnati, at like a weekend barbecue. It was probably my junior year. Um, I had no idea. I mean, even at that time, I'm sure there was, you know, some competitive cornhole going on, but I was too busy swimming, studying. Uh, but at that little barbecue, I mean, I didn't, I just I instantly fell in love, right? I mean, I just, the whole time I'm just throwing, even by myself, I'm like, oh, this is really cool. And uh, I'm an engineer as well by, by my degree. So I just went back and looked up the dimensions of the boards. I went right over to Home Depot and bought it all. Okay. And I like I painted them the exact same way of the first boards I saw, which is just plain white. And it had a corn stock painted in the middle and it had cornhole stenciled around it. And the funny thing was, uh, it's not there anymore, but on Wikipedia for a long time, when you went and searched cornhole, it was the board that I made was like the stock oh, picture. Somebody had it. <laughs> And I can tell it's mine because I remember hand painting the corn stock. I mean, I copied the other one, but I did all the hand, I hand painted the whole thing. 
and uh, they were out there for years. And I that's, hey, that's back. your claim to fame, man. Hey, you, you <laughs> that really, was so awesome. Big time. I was big like, time. this is so cool. So you uh, were um, talking about swimming. I mean, you were pretty good, right? Did you go to the Olympic trials or anything? I did. Yeah, that's I swam my whole life. So like from age yeah. five, I was a year-round swimmer. That was like, I mean, every you know, year round, you never had a break from age five until college. Um, I was getting a little burnt out, but knew I was good enough to probably get a scholarship. So I hung in there and I did. And then at the collegiate level, it was just so much fun, all the dual meets and just the competitive atmosphere, like the smaller teams. Um, you know, I loved it. Um, I did have quite a bit of success. I was you know, a three time conference champion in the Hunter Butterfly, uh, won you know, 200 AM, 100 breaststroke. Uh, but then at the end of the career, I did qualify for Olympic trials in the 200 AM and the 100 fly. So the, the way it works is they'll set a time standard for each event. Uh, they like around 100 swimmers to qualify in the whole nation per event. And then they go to one swim meet and you have to be first or second in your event to qualify for the team. So each nation can send two swimmers per event. Uh, so it's really hard. I was yeah. just like happy to get there and, and, and be a part of it. I ended up like, 32nd and 35th in my two events. I mean, that's still, that's last, still that pretty last swim meet ever. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Yeah. Still yeah. impressive. I mean, Thanks. My, my wife's family is like super like into swimming. Like they were, they were, they swam in college and stuff like that. So they're yeah. all, so I yeah. actually know a little bit about it. Like I knew nothing about it at first, but um, yeah, I know it's uh, tons of work that goes it's into It's an immense time in the water. Yeah. In college, it's, you know, it was six to seven 30 was morning workout then weights, and then four to six in the afternoon. That's, you know, every day. Do you think I was like, man, that, I just do you think any of that translated to cornhole, like work ethic wise? I think uh, just the regimen and being like, okay, like I'm a pro athlete here in a different sport. I, you know, I kind of model some of the same stuff. As far as like, I mean, my practice schedule hasn't been as regimented. That's something I need to work on. Um, but yeah, I think it just, it, just the whole competitive atmosphere, having the training aspect and then going and competing, fine tuning your game, creating goals. Um, you know, you learn all that from, you know, being a swimmer. I think a lot of it does, does come over. So one of the questions we like to ask a lot of the pros is what is, what is your, when you go to practice, like what's your routine? Are you just trying to are you just throwing deck arounds? Are you throwing like just keep throwing? Do you like to put yourself in a scenario? Do you just think, hey, I don't like to practice by myself. I'm just gonna go play blind draws. Like, what do you do? Yeah, I don't do any of the blind draws. Uh, I mean, occasionally I'll do them, but most of them are there. We have a lot in Phoenix. You can go every night, but they're. I just live kind of north Phoenix, and they're just too far away. And I get home at midnight, or you know, I'm up early for work. So my preference is I'm able to practice here at my house. Um, I don't go out for long periods of time. I do work from home, fortunately. So I'd rather go out there two or three times for shorter periods. And I do a, not that many things. Sometimes I'll just take two sets of bags and I play a game against myself, basically. Um, so I'll just alternate because that creates all the same situations I would have yeah. in a normal game. So I'll get my pushes, my cuts, my air mills. That helps me get the situational play. Um, I do like doing deck arounds. Um, and then I'll do like a deck around of just air mailing just to kind of keep that feeling and keep that on point as best I can. And right. really that's it. I mean, I think playing it, a game against yourself is such an underrated practice tool. Yeah. I, I don't get to get out as much as I can. So at the office, when I, where I work, like I get there early on Wednesdays. That's typically what I do for practice. Yeah. I have two sets of bags. If we're going to review them, I grab one set on one side and I just yeah. play my, play myself switch sides of the board as I'm going yeah. and, just keep throwing. I think it's great yeah. practice. It's like you said, it you just learn the, the, bags, the different subtleties of the bags too, right? You kind of yeah. like, okay, and I'm kind of always breaking a new bag, so it kind of accomplishes a lot of things at once. See, I always find myself falling in love with one set when I'm throwing two you different ones. So that, yeah, I'm always cheering on one set. <laughs> that one never ends up winning. And I'm like, God, damn, it's always it's always the more uh, friendly one. So I wanted to bring it back to Mark real quick. Um, so Mark you had mentioned that you started off doing baseball bats, which is fascinating to me. Did you learn anything from that experience that translated into making cornhole bags as well? Um, well, no, I mean, the one thing I learned was um, selling baseball bats is, 
in the uh, for MLB level players is damn near impossible. Um, and I don't know, I was just developing a um, technology that would prevent the bat from separating too far when it broke. Um, an ultra lightweight seat belt, if you will, okay. um, like a filament that is um, ultra strong and has good energy absorption qualities that weighed like less than a tenth of a percent was wound around the outside of the bat um, up to about the, the fatter part of the barrel as it goes up. And it just, you know, as it broke, it just kind of held onto the two pieces because what we were seeing around that time frame was these maple bats, which were just you know, awesome. Everybody wanted them, but the problem was, oh, is they, missiles, when they man. fracture, when they fracture, they fracture real clean and the amount of energy uh, yeah. dissipated was nothing. So the bat would just go flying off. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, I don't know, it caught my mind and I was like, oh, it'd be a cool thing to try, you know, and, and try to do an engineering um, project on basically. That was pretty much the whole point of starting the company Vortice was it, it really wasn't going to be anything particular. It was just whatever, you know, was interesting to me at the moment. Um, and, you know, if something were to take off, great, right? But it wasn't like, it would, I didn't start the company with anything specifically in mind. I just wanted to engineer some cool stuff. Can we, can we still find a Vortice bat like floating around the world right now? <laughs> no, there's only a few of them that I ever made. Um, we, you know, I, I tested a lot of them, you know, I had this like bowling ball that I rigged up on a pendulum and, and, the, and the bat was in a fixture that was located on the ground and I would stand up, you know, on a ladder and I let this bowling ball go and it swing down and it would, you know, hit the bat and I would take, you know, high speed video of that interaction. Um, it was cool. Um, I was, uh, what's the guy's name for the Padres? He used to do the broadcast. Um, he does a big broadcaster now. Anyways. <laughs> During a Padre game, they they were mentioning me because I won this like I came in second in a poker game with them, um, and they're like, "Yeah, Mark Pryor developing these spider bats, you know." And I'm just like, "Sweet," because <laughs> <laughs> kind of my my moment. And then I realized, you know, just selling bats was not going to be easy, especially breaking into the MLB with some new technology. That's not going to happen, right? Um, that became evident. You could have always corked it, all right? <laughs> right. That's the new thing. <laughs> Matt Vest Does MLB technology change, Mark? Like, is your, or is it still the same as it was? Uh, Matt Vaskersian was the guy I was thinking of, right? He's a big time, you know, Fox analyst, and he used to do Call the Padres back in, back when, in that time. So he had a poker tournament. I came in second. We're, I was talking with him, and then he, on the next game, that next night, he talked about my bat, which is really cool. Um, sorry, Doug, what was the question? Is it still a problem at the MLB level with the bats? Is it still made? Well, no, because they, 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 they solved a bunch of things and it had to do with the, the grain alignment. Um, you know, mm -hmm. maple bats will still fracture, but the grain now has to be aligned to within the certain tolerance, which helps. I think before the grain was kind of, you know, cutting across the bat and it would just unzip without any problem. And it would, you know, the, the heavy end of the barrel with this like super razor sharp point would go flying and it, it hit the pitcher in the, in the face, it hit the, player at third running home it stabbed him in the chest and it was sticking out of his you know upper shoulder oh, it hit people in the fans and it broke their jaw you know it's going right by kids faces you know so there's it's kind of this problem and i was like for oh. the love of the game mark for the love of the game <laughs> right now they have nets you yeah, know, they, do. That, that they, have nets. they have nets that extend so you know that really increased the safety um and then so it just wasn't a really a problem anymore. So it's a good thing I, I, you know, for those that are starting businesses, you know, be quick to pivot. You know, uh, a fun fact to... going off of baseball: our uncle is actually a major league umpire. That he is. It's a little tidbit there. Wow. So, yeah, he's a major league umpire. He was the youngest major league umpire ever. He's a little older now, but he was the youngest yeah, when, we ever made when, it we were, when we were young. He was yeah. the youngest. <laughs> Mark, how did your engineering background? Like, how do you think? How, how does your engineering background go into cornhole bags? Like, what are you doing? Like, what separates ultra bags from the next? Um, is it template? Is it, um, well, is it your combination of materials? Like, what is it? It's an understanding of um, all of the different parameters and how to optimize, right? Um, you know, with, with bag thickness being an issue, you know, that's something I, I really look um, look at a lot. And I don't know, maybe other bag makers can appreciate it, but you basically want to tune your bag so that when it breaks in, it meets minimum thickness. 
Um, yeah. You don't want to go under it or else a lot of people are going to be pissed off, right? Um, so that's a big deal. People are like, well, these don't feel as good as series, you know, Vipers. Well, you know, maybe series Vipers don't meet that minimum thickness now anymore because they got broken in too much, right? So that's kind of a big deal is like understanding those those properties and parameters and, and, and how to kind of stay, you know, within the safe side of things yet being on the cutting edge, right? Um, if the ACL ever got tough and started really measuring, I, I, I think there'd probably be a good 30% of the bags that get knocked out of the tournament. Oh, I think you're, yeah, I think that you're being which generous is, there with 30%. scary, right? We started seeing it in our own area where yeah. people are calling it out. And uh, luckily the Cleveland Cornhole guys have a rig made up that measures each, each thickness of the bag. And the, they're more than willing to, to kick the bags of the curb if they, if they don't meet the specs. I mean, it's part yeah, of the game. So- there's, there's like a lot of things that are not kind of well understood about those requirements either, you know, how it's tested and, and how, you know, so it's it, it, something like that is just something that, you know, as a corn oil maker, if you don't understand it clearly, man, it, it's going to come back and bite you. And I, I think, well, l- um, let me ask you this, is that you, as an engineer, do you like the ACL's back testing process right now? Or do you think there's room for improvement or things that they should? Well, I mean, they they'll tell you first so. off there's room for, for improvement i mean it's a bag that's directly out of the wrapper how long do you play with a bag that's directly out of a wrapper for until you throw it in the dryer you know washer and dryer you don't play with a bag right out of the wrapper especially in a tournament the yeah. bag is broken in and it's broken into your liking so a lot of things happen with the frictional properties of of the bag that change drastically as the bag breaks in so what they have is that i think is a starting point it's great it's out of the wrapper friction okay um, that's one thing that we're trying to develop. Uh, you know, we're, we have this uh, break-in method that's going to be um, clarified in a way where people can follow it. And then we'll have data um, on the slide properties as a, with a bag broken in, you know, in, in different conditions. So, you know, we all know that you add a little bit of humidity and things start to slow down. Yep. Or if you add some temperature, things start to really speed up. So, you know, I think they've just created just like an initial n- number. And, you know, if you look at it, there's not a lot of disparity between the data. Um, and some of the data is, you know, I'm like, well, those two bags have the exact same fabric yet. They're reading, you know, a 97 and a 95, right? Um, so, you know, I think there needs to be a lot more testing. Um, I, I think the, the Cornell uh, bag manufacturers should be doing that a lot themselves. You know, just really, really digging into the data and just having it, and, you know, Ultra, we started it, but we understood that, you know, okay, well, you know, if you really want to give them good information, you can't just do it half ass. It's got to be, it's got to be right. So we, in a way, we stopped doing it. We would just say, well, you know, this bag is more flexible than the Viper and it has a little bit more stick on the stick side. We just yeah. tell people relative to a bag that they understood from us, kind of what to expect, Right. Um, but, you know, we hope to, in a, in a little bit, provide a lot more data to give players like, okay, this is what I should expect from this, you know, Widow X. Yeah, I think, uh, especially the newest bags you released. So like, uh, we reviewed the Psycho X, the Viper B and the Widow X today. I think adding those bags to your, uh, your lineup was smart because obviously you had the Viper, which is, I'm assuming is your best seller. If I had to guess, it's probably their most popular bag. So you have a, a slick bag, but it's nice adding some um, controllable aspects to the bags. I think that some of the combinations were were smart and they're popular. Like the Viper B, I think is gonna be a very popular bag for you guys going forward. You guys especially me, that's for sure. Yeah, so that's Dane's new baby. So um, I think it was very smart. But I think um, Ultra Bags, you often get credited with, uh, listen, I think you guys were the ones that kind of kicked off the bag craze, right? For people like me that were like, you know, collecting bags and you know, hoarding them and doing all this stuff. Did you think the bag market was going to explode like it did as fast as it did? Well, I mean, we, we'd seen that before. Um, what in like 2014 ish, you know, it was kind of like this beer belly, right? Right. Yeah. Doug. Yeah. yeah. There's some other, you know, other players that were just, you know, selling bags like crazy. And I wasn't really making, you know, advanced bags at that point in time. Um, I was like, God, why, why are these bag makers just killing it in the bag area? And I'm trying to suffer with these cornel boards and beer pong tables and all other crap, you know? So, um, did I, is this surprising? No, 
No, because, you know, we, we all saw Cornell really start to pick up again. Um, you know, I think it's really, it's a good thing. Um, I don't know what the future will hold, but really stoked to be, you know, within the position we're in right now. You know, you never know, you know, if, if Cornell continues to grow at the rate it is, I think it will. If the economy will shrink, eh, it might. What will that do to Cornell? I don't know. It's kind of like, you know, your bars, right? Everybody's going to still drink beer. Everybody's going to yeah. still play Cornell. You know, we could, economy could be in a, in a shitter. We're all going to be at a bar throwing Cornell somewhere. So. Amen. Absolutely. So one, one more question kind of going off that. You had made the choice um, at one time. It was like a, maybe a year or two ago. I guess it was, it was an unpopular choice by the, you know, the consumer at the time to raise bag prices um what was your overall decision because you kind of set the market for pricing of like this new bag craze and where the market has gone for for prices what was your overall like what was the kind of the thought process behind that at first like to kind of go be kind of i guess the first one to really well i mean we we didn't really do that i I think who did it was the the rafflers and resellers okay they set the price yeah (laughs) <laughs> they did well, it. what i'm saying is they you're the first one you're the, but you're, that's what I'm asking, you're the first one to do it i mean everyone saw it happening but you were the first one to be like all right well if they're going to be making this much off the secondary market i should raise my price so is that was that the main reason behind it, it was like listen if they're if people are going to be willing to pay this much on the aftermarket then they should be getting it firsthand from us well yeah i mean it's that and you know we're you know capacity constrained which is a good thing right we can only produce a certain amount at the quality we're currently producing them at you know we could probably produce a bunch more at a lesser quality but we would never we would never ever do that um we always i'm a super big stickler on how the things are are done at the shop um and it kind of is what it is so um you know just in a very lucky situation right now that will probably change over the next you know 12 months probably right so do they continue to sell at high prices yeah, probably not, right? You know, will the market start to correct itself in time? Probably. Yeah. But right now, it, it, you know, what we're doing right now with the, the pro picks and our team, it's really the circle of coronal life that is just, it's really a good thing right now because, you know, these players are paying for expensive bags. We're then pu- funneling a bunch of money back to the players to play at a high level, right? So that, that circle of coronal life is just, a really beautiful thing, right? Well, you know, I, lo- we, I love the pro pick idea. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, um, it's designed to, to help us fund a big team. Um, and it's worked so far, right? We have like, uh, let's see here. I don't know, including PDC. I think it's like 50 players that are under contract. Right. Okay. Yes. So, you know, that's a big number. I mean, yeah, because ultra squad. Not, you guys run. You guys run deep. I mean, you guys are there, you guys nobody. Are nobody under contract is a couple sets of bags and gear. That's that's nobody. It's it's all significant numbers, oh, yeah. you know. And so you can multiply that time with a significant number, and you know that it's it's up there, right? Yeah, so, you know, how do we fund that? How do we pay royalties? How do we you know pay um, all these you know things that are happening in San Diego uh, or across the nation, really, with with the price inflation? Um, you know, I mean, it's working right now. Does it work in 12 months? I don't know. I, I don't see it going anywhere. I, yeah, I think it will, to it, me, it, the it, standard it. set of bags is going to pro stamp bags. I think it's going to, the market's going to land probably in like the 85 to 125 range here. I think it's, it's going to settle there for a while. It's, gonna depend on, it's just going to depend on volume in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, there's always, there's always a volume, but like you said, I mean, you you take the time to make sure every bag's exact and stuff. And yeah, I mean, there's, there's some other companies pumping out bags that they're still good quality, but is the craftsmanship quite as good as, as an ultra bag? I mean, it's, it's to the consumer to decide, but to me, like closing seam itself speaks, speaks volumes. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I was talking about it. I'm a Viper B thrower. I'm a, I'm a palm or seam in the palm thrower. I cannot feel that goddamn seam in my palm. It's, it's unbelievable. So I've like, it's broken me from that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that just speaks volumes to your guys' craftsmanship. And to me, I, I, you can see why you can charge that amount for, for a set of four bags, in my opinion. So I, I, 
I don't never. Well, I mean, it's, it, it's all temporary right now. I mean, you know, we don't sell nearly as many as we did at the $85 price point. Um, you know, it's just been a really cool thing. You know, the players, they get um, highlighted in a different way. You yeah. know, we focus on them. We focus on the bad colors that they picked. And, you know, it's kind of like that week, you know, the moment to kind of uh, for us to, you know, brag about the player and brag about the new bad colors that were chosen. So it's, it's been a great thing. I, you know, the price points, they'll, they'll, they'll change as soon as we're done with the pro picks. I mean, we have three um, pro pick pro bags pick. in front of us. I think I have Tanner Halper, Jay Rubin. I think that's Noel Almanza. I think they're the three that I have in front of me. So, I mean, I love the idea. I think it's a great, it, it's a good move. Zaf, you're throwing uh, the C's, right? Viper C's? This week, I threw the C's, yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, we're going to have a Viper C release um, coming up on Sunday, which nobody knows about except for now. Um, we'll, we'll hear about we it. Go. A bunch <laughs> of people are going to know about yeah. it now. You're hearing about and it. That, so be a little bit of that is because of what Doug did. You know, I was like, Absolutely. man, that Viper C getting in the finals against Matt Guy, let's let's go. Mark, I did have people reach out. I didn't even know. And, uh, you know, obviously, porno people are like, hey, you know, how many more pro picks are there? I really want to get that gold white set of seeds and i said well actually i was a custom design that i i did you know but uh there is interest in that color just so you know doug i wanted to ask you a question so we've joked before about um so your, your doubles partner bill had bag and bill right bag and bill. So he cracks me up when you watch him because it looks like he's just having so much fun you know he's standing there he's got his headphones in his foot's always tapping yeah all right, so tell me, what is he like, like playing with him? Um, I'm assuming you guys know each other pretty well. You guys play each other, obviously. You're in We've, yeah, Bill's awesome. I'm very fortunate to have him. Um, you know, he's really one of the one players out here that's pushed me. Um, and so I'm fortunate to have him. Um, he He's always had my number in singles, right? We always do well in doubles, and then he'll excel in singles, and I'm just kind of meh, so... Um, you know, it's been a, a driving force for me to, you know, I'm like, I need to just beat Bill, right? If I can beat Bill, I'll be doing all right. So <laughs> I'm lucky to have him. Uh, he, we both have fun, you know. Um, people always ask me what the music is. Yeah, that's exactly, kind of like, that was my next question. What is the music he's listening to? Kind of classic rock, that's what uh, some country. Um, I don't know. It doesn't get real specific. We, we've had fun before with guests trying to guess what song he's playing. So <laughs> it's always been fun. I want... Yeah. Whenever we shoot together, it's, it's uh, actually some old country. You know? All right. So yeah. I guess this is a question for both of you guys. Um, you guys were both at the last national event. What did you guys think of the team event? Do you like the addition? Did it, um, how was it different? Uh, Doug, like, what was your experience like on that? I like it. It's early right now, so it might not have felt like, oh, we're just, you know, we got some colorful jerseys on and doing some doubles games. But I think as the season progresses and the, the records start to shake out and maybe a few of the teams, you know, it's it seems like every match, I'm like, every match is going to be four to three. If you look at, you know, it seems like, it seems like yeah. that. Um, and I'm not quite sure how everyone's going to end up at Worlds if all of us, if it's just for seeding, I honestly don't know, but uh, I think the the intensity is really going to be there at the end of the season, right? That's where it's really going to shine. Uh, what team are you on? I'm on the Cutters, so I'm on Eddie Eddie G's Eddie, Eddie Grinder sleeves team. Okay. Yeah. And how did you guys do this past weekend? We uh, well, actually, as a team, we lost our first one. We won the middle two, and I'm not sure of the fourth one to be honest. I was just one kind of three to one. That's what I thought. I thought you guys did pretty well. Okay, so then we won. That, that's great. That's great. We had a <laughs> rough start, but finished out okay. Who did you play with in doubles? Noel Almanza. Oh, there we go. All right, so that's a good team. He's yeah, okay. uh, got to meet him. That was really the first time. Well, I met him in Louisville um, at the Open two okay. weekends ago. Um, now he's been doing really good, so we we're excited to, you know, throw together. And he's a great thrower. I really yeah, admire him. Yeah, he's uh, he's shot he, he can manipulate it back quick. like crazy. He's very talented. Noah, Noah was ridiculously good. Um, I had a, I had a, a, one of the pro players reach out to me. He said he played them, and um, let me get the number that he said. It was, let's see here. He threw an eleven point four seven EPR over. So 
68 bags thrown, 68 bags thrown, throwing psycho. So 11.47 with 68 bags that he threw. So um, that yeah, is, that's a number. That's going to get it done. And, you know, I, what I like most about him is just like, you know, he's so nice, right? But he's such a good competitor, right? Oh, he's yeah. getting all the shots. He doesn't seem to get rattled with who he's throwing against. And he's just down the middle getting it done. Yeah, he's, he's definitely got a – he's got a switch that he flips. We've we've had the pr- privilege of seeing him a couple times up here in Ohio. And uh, every time we see him, he just – he can talk to you in between shots. But then when he steps up to the board to throw – I've never seen somebody lock in oh, yeah. as quickly as he can. It's it's almost unnerving. So I'm gonna have a I'm gonna we have a listener question here. All right, I, I think it's interesting. Um, Doug, Nicholas Howe wants to know. He's like he thinks you look like an actor or someone that mm-hmm. is familiar. Do you ever get mistakenly um, taken for like a celebrity? And if so, who is it? There are two. I get one more than the other. First one is Dana Carvey. Okay, yeah, yeah, I gotta see that. <laughs> uh, I've had that all my life. I mean, even, you know, I don't, okay, I guess I do. And then the other one more recently, I'm not as familiar with, he's on a, I don't know, just a uh, network show is Mike Ross. Oh, I yeah, know. yeah, yeah, from uh, Suits. Yes, from Suits. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, you do, yeah, yeah. okay, now yeah, that I can, I can see, see that. that now, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a great show, by the way, if you haven't checked it out, it's a good show. Okay. It's not on it. anymore, but it's uh, he did well on the show, so that should do well. That should mean something. I like He's not Dana ugly. Carvey so much more though. That's, oh, that's, okay. that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. So this is Nicholas How He always comes up with these awesome questions. So he wants to know what is the tried and true Mount Rushmore of bags? Okay, and you can't have more than one ultra bag on there. This is for both of you. Like Mount the, Rushmore of all Mount time? Mount Rushmore, top four bags made of all time. You can only have one ultra bag on there. Oh. Why don't go ahead, Doug? How about you pick two? <laughs> pick two? Huh? You pick two, I'll pick two. Well, I mean, it would probably be, you know, the Viper and the uh, the Reynolds kind of like original carpet bag. Pro Advantage, yeah. yeah. Pro Advantage. Yeah, yeah, I did say that one before Ultra. I think another one that really... Uh, everyone through early on was just the original play rights, right? That's the original yeah. play. They had the newer kind of slick material that I think spawned into the let's do slick slick, right? Yeah. Um, I put that one up there. Mm. What? What was the first one again? Sorry. He said a slide right. Oh, slide right. One. Wow, slide right, huh? Not a game changer. I would have said a game changer if it came from all Cornell. Well, or you guys too. being like kind of West Coast guys, I was thinking maybe like the OG Razor. Yeah, yeah, the Razor um, probably could be up there because they were, you know, Matt. Matt was like the first person to bring that fabric to market. Yeah. Um, and then it, it appeared on my Vapor. Uh, Vapor was the next bag on the market, and I think maybe a couple others had it, and then Game Changer brought it to market. Right. Yes. So, um, it went Razor, Ultra, maybe a few others, and then it went Game Changer. They just happened to throw a patch on it. Which is a really cool idea. I mean, to have that loose fabric on both sides and then to figure out, okay, let's sew a patch on it. Pretty damn cool idea. I agree. Uh, I mean, it's definitely unique. I mean, you guys, you can make the argument that so are throwing the control dots on a bag. No one else was doing that at the same, at the time. Yeah, that was unique. That was pretty cool. Um, so what would be this fourth one we're talking about here? Well, I think we got it. I think it'd be the, I mean, I'll pick the slide right and game changer. Viper for, from Ultra, if we got one Ultra in there. Yeah, but it can't be two from the around. same company. So you need to pick, you know. <laughs> He's making the rules now. I mean, I'm, I'm just sitting here listening. So I, I would definitely make, yeah. There's, there's, um, there's no rules <laughs> in the question, so. Let's see here. Let's just say you can't, right? It, let's say you slide right, it's done with all cornal. Who would be the next? Mm. Uh, oh, is it the razor? Is that what you said? I mean, that's why I, I threw out there. I just didn't know if you guys were familiar with that. I didn't know if, if you had thrown no, that before. I'm fine with that. It's, it's a good yeah. pick. No, I agree. I still have a set of razors. I have one of the originals. It's probably because uh, I have them all. 
Like, you got them all. I have a lot of OG razors. Yeah, so with Sean and I like yeah. mess around in the backyard. That's typically what we go grab. If OG anyone puts up a set to sale, them. I typically just buy yeah, them. Just, we, just I we love busted them. Busted many, oh, yeah. many a razor yeah. OG as <laughs> boards for sure. Absolutely. Um, let me look up some other of these. Um, let's see. Trey Wampler wants to know, um, is Ultra going to be releasing any version of a carpet bag in the future? Is there anything that people can look forward to? Because apparently that's all. Yeah, we have, you know, three carpet-ish bags coming out shortly. Um, it's a fabric that's n- not on any other bag. Um, is that going to be the R series? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's two fabrics that we're working with. One is a little bit firmer. One is a little bit looser. So the Viper and Widow R will have that, that looser carpet. And then okay. the Vapor R will have the little bit firmer one, which appeared on the Cobra and Raptor R as test bags. Okay. So there's just a few bags that we released under Cobra and Raptor R to kind of get an idea of, you know, if people were digging it. And, you know, we get so many good compliments from those that have tried the Cobra R. Uh, our friend uh, JC had a set and he's like, dude, check these out. I'm like, wow, I was, I was, I'm impressed. I mean, you know, to have a bag that's been fully broken in, you know, some sometimes as a bag maker, you don't really get the luxury of like fully, fully breaking in a bag. So um, it's kind of, a, it's a good fabric. I think, I think the Vapor R would, it might be a bag that just, I don't know, really surprises people. So excited about those three to come out. They'll I think the, come I out think the Vapor early. in general is just underrated. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a great, great bag. Like I've I've always been a fan. I'm not gonna lie though, I, I I'm always fond of your Cobra X. It was like oh yeah, dude. I it's used to throw oh, yeah. dude, I love that fucking bag. Yeah, you still throw um, nice. We got we got another question from uh, Doug. Lucas this is Meyer. for you, and just just it's, hang it's with us for a second, Doug, all right? So, these listener yeah. questions go all over, but I love these questions. Yeah. Um, so this guy is he's an awesome guy from Iowa. Um, so he's, he asked if you had to use a bag of M and M's, any any flavor, okay, stay with us, or a bag of Skittles, any flavor, to throw instead of cornhole bags, which would you choose and why? Get to the heart of it now. Well. Wow. Interesting fact, I always have peanut M&Ms at my tournaments. I think it's a great little <laughs> snack, a little energy. Uh, Bill always brings, like, he's like, hey, brought peanut M&Ms. It's kind of our thing. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see me snacking on those. But if I had to pick for cornhole, I'd stick with M&Ms, but probably originals, if that's what they mean by flavor. Uh, yeah. Just because of size and shape, I think that would be most conducive to yeah. You know, I can tell you're a pro because I was going to ask. Do you know the best part? Do you know the best part about it? There was actually like a little debate on our page about this, like <laughs> people arguing about it. And the one said like they would want peanut M and M's, but they wouldn't want to waste them. I mean, in a bag. So right. like, Don't they make mini M and M's? What? What's oh. that? They make mini M and M's. Oh, they do. They That's do right. The cornhole. Yes. That might actually feel pretty good, right? With the candy. Yeah, it would be like that very, and it's stuff. kind of the same size as resin. I mean, you guys got to yeah. be careful throwing that out like on a hot day. That's right. Well, the candy shell, right? Melt, That's true. Melts in your mouth. Melt. Melt. Melt your hand. I get it. Serious. Yep. Um, does it melt in your back? We don't know yet. Most of these got covered. Mark, I think you. I think you got something to try. New fill. Done. Right, you hey, just like a little break zipper down on one time. side when your energy is running low, just unzip it and <laughs> zip it in your mouth. Zipper, pour a couple of a zipper on it, absolutely. So, Doug, I have a bag that's full of like a liquid, like tequila or something, right? <laughs> yeah, correct, correct. <laughs> he has like a little Einstein had one question yeah. for you. He wanted me to ask you, what is your what's your drink regimen before you play? He said it's pretty unique. Nick asked this, yeah, Nick, 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 Nick. Nick. <laughs> No, it's pretty simple. I mean, I start with ultra beers, kind of like ease into it. But before, let's say, a, a, you know, like tough, tough opponent, I have to get like the two or three in first. And then I do make a little Red Bull vodka that just gives me a little spark. And some it's for some reason, it kind of focuses me. Uh, I don't know what's in it, but I, you know, I think it helps. Okay. None of us do. So yeah, so if you want to if you want to win your bracket at a national, the Red Bull vodka is endorsed. I mean that could be a sponsorship opportunity for you right there. <laughs> I mean that's I mean, that could be good stuff right there. <laughs> well, um, Sean, thank I, you both I for joining us. Real... Oh, go, go ahead, Mark. What's what is your guys's uh, you know regiment? You know, are you just like 
Oh God! Podcast. Whatever's there is it, is it a couple Miller Lights? Um, it's yes, yeah. Yes, it's yes, typically and, it's uh, typically a Bloody Mary on the way to the tournament because um, <laughs> he makes a killer Bloody Mary, and then it's uh pretty yeah. We're pretty more beer guys throughout the day. I mean, if I start going to liquor too hard, then it's going to go downhill. Yeah, quick. then he's, he starts dancing, and it's like Sean, we're here for phenomenal dancing. Yeah, he's he he's a great dancer when he gets uh, liquored up on Jameson. But, I'll give him that. Yeah, but yeah, if I'm if I'm if I'm playing, it's mostly like light beer of some sort, but. No, do you guys yeah, do um broadcasting as well? I've seen you commentate a few times. How we, we did we... the Erie Open. Um, we did uh when we were in Cincinnati, Cincinnati. um, and we do uh the Cleveland cornhole uh regionals and stuff like that. We're going to be going down to Kansas City next, next week, week, um, next weekend, and we're hoping to hop on with uh Wally here and there, but you know, we're if playing. we can, yeah, we're actually we're going, going to try to play. To play. Uh, we figure we're down there away from the family. I never get to play anymore, so. It'll be like my second time playing all year. So I mean, the last three big tournaments we've gone to has just been for commentating. Yeah, so just I'm, getting content and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm looking forward. So to you, you know, Wally and, and and I, you know, we do these commentating. You'll yes. be sitting for you know twelve hours, right? Oh yeah. A day, and you, you'll have like three days of like twelve hour stints. Um, that can be difficult, right? You need to pace yourself. Yeah. Um, but you want to have a good time, you know. So. Uh, during our uh, ultra feature court, you know, we had some commentators come in and add a little bit of color to the commentary and it was fun. We had a couple of viewers come back and say, you know, wow, that, were, you know, that wasn't as good. Right. Um, if you ever get feedback, like on your podcast, like, Hey, you know, stick to what you know, or, you know, don't try to get to this or that, or is it, is your viewers pretty cool with letting you to be you. um i my and i know it's a pet peeve of mine um during interviews and we actually talked about before why i like having headphones when we're on zoom calls is it's a slight delay when you guys are coming back to us so sometimes i'll interrupt guests because i just get too excited and want to ask mm -hmm. so i'll start talking over you and because I'm, I'm deaf like i have a really i'm bad at, i'm a really hard of hearing so sometimes i can't tell if you're talking if i'm also talking so i've had people respond like hey like let the guests talk so I, I've been trying to get better at that. But when we'd actually commentate, um, the big thing is we'll start talking about other things because I think sometimes it's boring. Like, hey, if you're throwing, if you're playing against Matt Guy, right? And you guys are throwing 12s like for four straight rounds. I don't need to tell the people that, right? Oh, he slides another bag in the hole. Like, that's great. Like if he hits a big shot, we'll go for it. But we kind of talk about other things while we're doing it. And people tell us to, it's not a podcast and to kind of stick to the what's going on in the match. So mm -hmm. I need to stop reading the comments. Could I get mad? And then I'll actually call them out while we're commentating. So yeah. I just need to, stick to I need to stick to that. Luckily we didn't have any bad comments. So I really appreciate all the viewers that stuck with us. Um, one of the things that was kind of funny though, is this, the shot where, you know, this bag, you know, when you throw the bag and it hits your opponent's bag right in front, you're trying for an airmail, hits their opponent's bag, you bounce off and they go in. And I was like, man, you know, there's probably a name for it, but I was like, oh, that, that, whatever the name is, it, it should be nasty because that's, that's a horrible thing to have happen to you, right? You feel horrible about it. I said, you know, I said, what, what, what if it's called like an STD, right? Because you don't want an STD, <laughs> right? I'm like, what if that we call that an STD? So me and D-Boy were saying that we're cracking up, right? We're having the best time. And um, then I was like, you know what? You know what's better is let's call it an STB, right? For Sean Fears, we used to have this thing where we tell him he would do something in the bed, if you know what I mean, right? When you <laughs> blow up a game and you, you know, SH, whatever. Yeah, you, you can swear, swear bed, right? it's okay. So we, we would then start to refer to it as uh, STBs, you know, and um, I don't know, I, I really loved it, but I just, you never know, like, okay, does your viewers like get offended easily or they're down with having a good time? Hey, this right. is cornhole, man. If, well, if it's you're all, easily it's, offended, this is not your game. It's yeah. also 2022, so you, do, you never really know if who's going to get offended. But luckily, it's we have like, enough episodes out. We have a, a good enough following where people kind of know what they're going to get. They're not going to – it's – I mean – Yeah, I mean, when when people – the one time we got a comment, the only time we ever got a comment when we were commentating, I mean, like he said, he, he took it to heart and was just so eaten up about it. I'm like, dude, who – cares because we i mean at the time we were up to a couple thousand viewers when we we're on wally's page and i'm like look one comment out of a couple thousand people we're it's my goal it's right. my goal to do it, it more matter. um i think you guys do an awesome job with the broadcast and like just the, the camera views and the live stream like that just i mean think back two years ago at a national event if it wasn't on espn you weren't there you were you're getting like stuff on the phones now mm -hmm. i got four different courts to go watch i mean that's it's awesome and i think everyone did a great job in keeping it flowing um, I thought you guys were the most consistent all day. You knew what you were going to get on your broadcast all day. And I, I just, I mean, 
a hats off to because I know it's a long day. When we were in Erie, I think we sat there for eight straight hours and doing it. It's fun though. I mean, you kind of lose track of time, especially when you get some good games. It's something we want to do more, but we have to be asked to do it by the ACL, and I have to stop. Mm-hmm. Like, hopefully, they still like us and stuff because. Yeah. They weren't mad. They weren't happy with me for a little Sorry, bit. We're gonna, we're gonna show up in Kansas City when yeah. they open, and they they won't have any choice. So maybe you'll they're hear us in Kansas City. Us. I'm hoping so, at least for <laughs> awesome. a little bit. One question before you guys go, right? We brought up a counter, kind of a topic in our episode. You, I, I, obviously, Mark. I know you're familiar with him. He was a sponsored player from you last year. Made a little bit of noise this weekend. Uh, Tyler Parent. What is your guys' thought about this step over rule? Uh, I, taking him as a person completely out of it. What do you think of the rule as a general? Do you think that it, there, it should be allowed? Do you think that yeah, they need to? It doesn't help you. Rule? When was the last time you've seen a step up person, step over uh, person in the finals? I mean, like if he were to, if he was in the finals and he beat Matt Guy, okay, that's a much different conversation. Yeah. Right. But he didn't, you know, he did really well. He, he, you know, had quite a game against Chucky Love. I think that lasted like 40 some odd minutes, yeah. um, you know, and he beat some amazing players. So yeah. I, I don't really think that does much. I, I think the problem a little bit is like, okay, what happens if we were to incorporate technology that helps us determine if there's a footfall? Well, it gets a lot more difficult now because like, let's just say you had a laser that, you know, just uh, turned on a light when that, when something cut, you know, over that line, right? It's That'd so be a nice cool. little thing for the player to say, look down at and say, okay, am I crossing, right? Did it turn red when I threw the bag, right? Well, now with a step over, you can't really do that because you're always crossing over. Um, I guess that would probably be the only th- argument I would make to say, hey, let's just keep it to where you have to stay back because that way we can control and give players real-time feedback. Hey, you know, you're, you're putting your foot on the line every time. Just step back four inches and, and stop foot fouling because that help happened a bunch of times where viewers are going, it's driving me crazy, you know? This person is stepping over the line every throw. And I'm like, yeah, you know, as commentators, we don't say anything about it because it's not none of, not really our business to say something about it. Correct. But, um, you know, I, I mean, what is your thoughts on it, Doug? Step I didn't see all the posts. I mean, I heard about it, but I mean, were both feet potentially over the line or just? Oh one? yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah they're both. And, and I mean, for now, I just think you got to play within the rules. I mean, as far as I know, is the rule you got to stay in the box. At, when you release the when at the time you release the bag, one foot has to remain in the box. But what the the catch is that on the follow, there's nothing that says anything about the follow through. Okay, so it's a little gray area. I That's what I'm saying. I'm That's my point. Is I think it just needs box, to be. Right? Right? As long as you got your back to the box, you're still okay. But uh, that's to me where I have maybe a little bit of an issue, right? I think it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you, upon release, both feet have to be behind the line. No, one foot, you can be over the line, but it cannot be touching the ground at yeah, release. So you can be stepping over that line and throwing it. Okay, in and release, but you can't you be stepping out. on the other side when you release. It's just yeah, it's an I interesting mean, I, topic. I think that next year at this time, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a major alteration to the rules. I'll just be interested to see what the ACL. Well, I was surprised it. it didn't happen this year, right? I mean, yeah. Why allow it, right? What what does it do for the game? I think it's hard to rule. It's so like you'd have to have a slow mo, right? Replay to, to to really. I mean, if you're just doing the one foot over, right? Um, like if you're doing the Frank Modlin, you know what I mean? Where his one foot stays in the box but he steps forward as he's releasing it. Like, to me, that's yeah. one way. But what Ty, And that's, to me, that's what Tyler used to do. But this weekend, as he, after he released, both feet were going. And then oftentimes, he was hovering on the other person's side. He yeah. Crossed, like, he crossed the midline a few times. Which, so that's, to me, that can be considered Bush League, right? You yeah. know, that's stuff that, you know, if you're interfering with the other player at all, really, in an intentional way, you know, some of that's going to, I'm not saying Tyler specifically, but other people, they, they might do things intentional, right? Like yeah. if, if I knew it bugged you where I kind of got you uh, in your periphery every throw and I did a little dance four feet in front of you, you know, if that really blew up your game, I'd probably incorporate that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's Bush. It should probably. Well, it's a, to me, it's the down. same in Cleveland. There's Mark, a guy, all, here. all you got to do is just reach down and grab your bag. Whenever there's Sean's one, going there's one guy here. And I, oh. so we play advanced here. I, I never get to play, but there's one guy I always struggle with. And it's because he does something very small every time about to go throw. 
and my back's yeah. way. That's when he bends over to pick up his bag. And you it know, just catches me just – and it shouldn't bother me. I know that. It shouldn't bother me, but it does. Well, Sean, you know, some people are, get bothered differently. I mean, you, you probably – you know, I have a little bit of ADD. I think people that have ADD suffer from any kind of motion, right? Because we just pick up on it and all of a sudden we get distracted, right? Um, so like oftentimes I'll have to shut my left eye, right? I'll close my left eye so I can't see what the other person's doing, right? And that's that the only sense. reason why I close my eyes so that I can close out any motion that's coming from like the left side. I, mean, I might have Crazy. to try that. <laughs> doesn't uh would Trey Trey Hunt doesn't he they do that with one arm he, yeah, with he, one eye yeah he opens one eye but he's he I don't know that. why he does it his might be more of a he says it's more like shooting like aim small yeah. be small with one one eye open it works. Type deal. yeah I'll close my eyes specifically just so I can cut out any distractions that are coming from the left side which is and I'll close crazy, both my but... eyes because then it's a it's an excuse as why I didn't make the bag <laughs> correct right <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'll, we'll, we're going to let everyone else go. I'll have you guys hang on just for a minute, but thank you both for joining us. So taking time out of your day, we greatly appreciate it. Wanted to get both of you guys on for a long time. So this was definitely an ultra based episode. We reviewed some of your bags, having both of you guys on Uh, Doug, congratulations again on an amazing weekend. It's not going to be the only time you're on a broadcast. I'm sure you and bag and bill are going to make another run. We'll see you in singles again, and we wish you nothing but the best. And Mark, thank you for joining us. Continue to make killer bags. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. We'll let the folks go at home. So, as always, we hope you throw it straight. And it's nothing but four baggers from here on out. Cornhole it. Later.